All right, good morning. Welcome to the Bureau of Automotive Repair Advisory Group meeting. This is our third of the year meeting. We have quarterly meetings. We've had our January and April meetings, and this is now our third of the four scheduled meetings. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Patrick DeRay, Chief of the Bureau of Automotive Repair. And I hope everyone's having a, a nice and not so hot summer of 2018 um, and getting some valuable vacation time in as, as time allows. Uh, we are um, excited to be here to talk about a number of issues that, uh, well, some ongoing discussions of uh, and reports on various topics as well as a couple of uh, new items, um, one in particular that will include um, an outside presenter, uh, Jean Lopez. Is Jean here, actually? Yeah, Jean, good. Good one to make sure you were here. Um, we'll go around the room uh, here at the dais and uh, make sure we get everybody properly introduced. And if you could kindly um, hit the button so that your green light appears, that way we'll be able to pick up everyone for those who are listening in, we do webcast all of our meetings. Um, so those who are not fortunate enough to be here physically in our presence and participate in the meetings can still participate via webcast. Welcome, Dave Kusa. Um, so those listening in via webcast uh, certainly. Send us uh, your comments and questions as they relate to the various presentations on the agenda today. Uh, the method for doing that is to email us from the webcast at bar meeting, B-A-R meeting, all one word, at dca.ca.gov. Bar meeting at dca.ca.gov. All right, let's begin with the introduction, starting with Vince, to the farthest to my right. I'm, Vin I'm Vince Gregory with uh, AAA, Northern California. Megan McKernan, Auto Club of Southern California. Jack Moladonna for representing the California Auto Body Association. Dave Cusa, Automotive Service Councils of California. Gary Conover, Automotive Wholesalers Association. Elisa Reinhart, California New Car Dealers Association. Lou Anapolsky, California Midas Dealers Association. Ruben Power, California Automotive Teachers. Uh, Bud Rice, sitting in for John uh, Gallo with Cal ABC. Nikki Ayers, Independent Automotive Professionals Association. Welcome, and thank you for the introductions. One of the things what we have done, I should uh, report at the outset, is kind of reconstituted the advisory group. Uh, one of the things that we noticed that there wasn't a, a clear structure uh, as it related to um, appointment timeframes, um, how good the, how long the, the, and duration of the, the appointment should be. There wasn't a clear designation of who the uh, representative from the various associations uh, was, as well as uh, providing a mechanism for an alternate to be named uh, and sit in for the um, the regular advisory group member in the event that that person uh, was unable to attend the meeting. We wanted to make sure that all the organizations had an opportunity to attend the meeting, even if the uh, primary um, representative was unable to be here, as is the case here today with Bud Rice as the alternate for California um, Automotive Business Coalition, or CalABC, and Johan Gallo is a normal attendee of these uh, meetings and uh, participant, but is on vacation this week because of a scheduling change on my part, and I apologize, because I have vacation next week, so, all right, so let's move on. We've got a busy agenda. I'm very pleased to be uh, able to introduce our first guest, um, Karen D. Nelson, as I'm always seeing her email, the Karen D. Nelson. Karen Nelson from the Department of Consumer Affairs um, is a deputy director with our 
uh, Board and Bureau Relations. Is that the proper title? Board and Bureau Services. Bureau of Service. It used to be called Board and Bureau uh, Relations. Board and Bureau Services. She's the Deputy Director with that office. Very pleased to have you here. Thank you very much, Karen, to give an update on the Department of Consumer Affairs and some activities that have happened uh, since our last meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Chief DeRay, uh, Advisory Committee members, and actually Assistant Deputy Director um, Karen Nelson, and that's okay. We love Christopher Castrillo, who is our Deputy Director, which I believe you've had a pleasure of meeting um, sometime in the fall of last year. So thank you again for giving me this brief opportunity to give you a department update um, related to some department and board and bureau activities since the last time we all saw each other. Um, on June 25th, the director had his first board member and advisory committee leadership teleconference. We had over 30 people participating, and it included uh, presidents, vice presidents, chairs, vice chairs, and some representatives from our advisory committee um, groups. And I wanted to thank Mr. Maladonna for actually participating and joining the call. And I hope you, d you did find that call very valuable, and we did share some pretty in um, informative things about the department. Some of the things we uh, did update the members on was about Assembly Bill 2138, which I believe is on your agenda to hear about today, as well as pro rata update and also the regulatory process improvement um, pieces and plans that we're trying to do in our legislative affairs and legal departments. And so we, since that call, we, we had some very positive feedback, and we do hope to continue having those um, teleconferences in the future, so I will make sure to go ahead and provide those dates when it is available. Um, specific to our licensing and enforcement work groups, we've had those meetings monthly, and I wanted to thank the Bureau for sending their staff um, to join in in that dialogue so that we can learn about best practices, some efficiencies, and perhaps look at collaborating with our bureaus and um, boards to look at best practices. and looking at standardizing some of the, the processes we have. So in licensing, um, we did hear from Dr. Um, Dr. Morris with the Executive Officer of Board and Registered Nursing and heard about their cloud drive, which then would help um, streamline some of their licensing application processes. And uh, the Enforcement Work Group has since discuss process improvements for performance measure two, as well as recently heard a presentation from the Department of Justice specific to the Attorney General's annual report containing information on accusation referrals as well as adjudicated accusations for our DCA boards and bureaus. Um, I do believe a couple of the bureau staff were in attendance and were able to receive and hear about statistics specific to the bureau and things that um, the Department of Justice and the Bureau were working on. And lastly, I wanted to just briefly touch on the Future Leadership Development Program, which an, an inaugural co cohort graduated um, this past March. We're currently in recruitment for our second cohort and have received 48 applications in this cycle, and hopefully that we'll have someone from BAR represented in that group as well as um, in the inaugural co cohort, we did have Brian Clark represented. So that is all I had for today, for today's update. And as always, if the department can be of service to you um, and the Bureau, let us know. And thank you for your work. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments? Jack. Yeah, Maladonna. Jack Moladonoff, uh, California Auto Body Association. Thank you for that report. Um, I did participate on, in that conference call, the director's leadership conference call, and I thought it was productive, uh, and I thought it was interesting, and, and I was much appreciative of the update that, that was provided with regard to the regulation process. As you know, um, one of the things that's been frustrating for some of the industry is that uh, trying to uh, promulgate regulations takes a very long time, years, and uh, at least uh, I understand that there's some effort to improve the process, streamline the process. I know there's additional training uh, that took place um, and uh, some, some streamlining processes that you've, you're in the process of implementing, so I'm hopeful those will be, you know, they're implemented and that will speed up the process in terms of um, the quality of the regulations as well as just making sure that we, these things don't take years to occur. Um, so I much appreciate the, uh, the update on that, and hopefully uh, those processes will uh, take place here soon. Thank you.
Thank you. And you know, we're very much aware of our boards and bureaus having some concerns with the regulatory process. And therefore, you know, in the update, we did talk about creating a dashboard so we ha we can better track of how um, how and where regs are currently in the process. So that's currently being um, formulated and developed. And also the agency, the Business Consumer Services Housing Agency has hired an attorney specifically to review our regs, so the department's regs. So hopefully all of those additions will help improve efficiencies in the process. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both and appreciate Jack uh, representing the, uh, this advisory group uh, before that advisory group. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Did anyone else have any questions, comments? All right, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, moving right along, our next presenter, uh, our standing present presentation on legislation and regulations, uh, backed by popular demand, Brian Clark. This is always a, an interesting time of year because of, uh, I think, much more is known about the status of bills than, uh, than other points in time during the year. So I'm uh, very much looking forward to the list of bills, which has grown as it relates to bills we are tracking. Um, certainly there's other bills beyond this that uh, might be on your, um, on your radar, um, but these are the ones specifically uh, relative to the Bureau of Automotive Repair where there is some involvement or uh, potential involvement of BAR and its its various laws and regulations. Um, thank you, Brian. Good morning, uh, members of the committee, Chief DeRay. Uh, my name is Brian Clark. I'm BAR's uh, rulemaking and legislative projects manager, and I'll be providing the legislation and regulations update. <clears throat> Beginning with AB 2138, uh, this is a licensing board's criminal convictions. Um, the bill passed the Assembly and was ordered to the Senate on May 31st, 2018. Uh, most recently, it passed the public safety, Senate Public Safety Committee and refer, was referred to the Senate Appropriations Committee on June 26, 2018. It is currently scheduled for a hearing on August 6, 2018 before the Appropriations Committee. Um, the bill would limit the use of criminal history by DCA entity to deny, suspend, or revoke a license to convictions for crimes substantially related to the qualifications, functions, or duties of the business or profession for which the individual is seeking licensure or is licensed. Uh, it would also define the term conviction and would set uh, time limits and time and other limits on the use of criminal history and information um, in regards to denying professional licenses or applications for licensure. Um, also, it would prohibit applicants from being required to disclose any criminal history or information or documentation. AB 2276. Um, this pertains to motor vehicle insurance auto body repair. Uh, it passed the assembly and was ordered to the Senate on May 31st, 2018. Uh, recently, most recently, it was amended and referred to the Senate Appropriations Committee on July 3rd, 2018. It is currently scheduled for a hearing on August 6th, 2018 before the Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, the bill pertains to participation in and use of auto body repair labor rate surveys. Um, and also, the, the bill was recently amended to clarify that the ins an insurer is not required to conduct an auto body repair labor rate survey and may use other methodologies to determine the prevailing auto body labor rate. Moving on, AB 2392, uh, towing and storage. This bill passed the assembly and was ordered to the Senate on May 29th, 2018. Um, most recently, it was amended and re-referred to the Senate Judiciary Committee on June 20th, 2018. It was then withdrawn from the committee and referred to the Senate Appropriations Committee on June 21st, 2018. Uh, currently, it is scheduled for a hearing on August 6th, 2018 before the Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, this bill uh, addresses requirements and limits on towing and storage facilities and fees. AB 2825, debt collection practices. Uh, this passed the assembly and was ordered to the Senate on May 30th, 2018. Um, it was referred recently, most recently referred to the 
uh, Senate Appropriations Committee on June 27, 2018. Uh, it is scheduled for a hearing on August 6, 2018 before the Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, this bill generally applies to protections of the Rosenthal Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and the Fair Debt Buying Practices Act to the collection of certain government debts and debts arising from the towing, impounding, and storing of vehicles. Uh, it would define the terms towing debt collection, towing debt collector, and towing debt, and list prescribed conduct and practices that towing debt collectors would be prohibited from engaging in when collecting or attempting to collect a debt and provides monetary penalties for the violations. <clears throat> AB 2832, Lithium Ion Vehicle Battery Cycling Advisory Group. Uh, this, passed, this bill passed the Assembly and was ordered to the Senate on May 30th, 2018. Most recently, it was amended and referred to the Senate Appropriations Committee on July 2nd, 2018. It is currently scheduled for a hearing on August 6th, 6th 2018 before the Appropriations Committee. Uh, this bill addresses the creation of, in, in, uh, of, of a uh, lithium-ion car battery recycling advisory group, uh, which would review and advise the legislature on policies pertaining to the recovery and recycling of lithium-ion vehicle batteries. Um, it would require the advisory group by April 1st, 2020 to submit policy recommendations to the legislature aimed at ensuring that as close to 100% as possible of end-of-life lithium-ion batteries discarded in this state are recycled in a safe and cost-effective manner. AB 2908, uh, tire, tire recycling. Uh, it passed the assembly and was ordered to the Senate on May 30th, 2018, uh, most recently. It was amended and referred to the Senate Appropriations Committee on July 2nd, 2018. It is uh, pending a hearing, a scheduled <coughs> hearing, before the Appropriations Committee on August 6th, 2018. Uh, this bill would require Cal Recycle to adopt regulations establishing the California Tire Regulatory Fee. Um, it would authorize Cal Recycle to set different fees based upon the number of tires wasted, nature of activity, generating waste tires, and other factors as deemed appropriate. A stat would establish a goal of not less than 75% of solid waste tires generated by source reduced or recycled in the state annually. Uh, would require a waste tire generator that is a retail seller of new tires for consumer vehicles to pay a tire regulatory fee and would enact the Tire Recycling In Inventive Program Act. <coughs> AB 3097, smog check report. Uh, it passed, this bill passed the assembly and was ordered to the Senate on May 31st, 2018, and was referred to the Senate Rules Committee on June 13th, 2018. Currently, there is no hearing scheduled. Uh, the bill would require the annual smog check performance reports to include the number of vehicles for which the owners failed to renew their registration with the Department of Motor Vehicles after failing a smog check. <clears throat> uh, the smog check performance reports uh, something that was generated by bar well actually later in the agenda we'll actually have a presentation from Greg Coburn from our engineering uh, division on the um, this year's reports AB 3141 uh, this is a uh, bar sunset review uh, status is uh, it passed the assembly and was ordered to the Senate on May 30th 2018 uh, most recently it uh, passed the Senate Business, Professions, and Economic Development Committee and was referred to the Senate Appropriations Committee on June 26, 2018. Uh, hearing is scheduled on August 6, 2018 before the Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, the, the, the bill would uh, amend B BPC Section 9882 uh, to provide that the powers and duties of BAR be subject to review by the appropriate policy committees of the legislature as if the Automotive Repair Act were to be repealed on January 1, 2023. And also, it would authorize BAR to obtain copies of full face engraved pictures or photographs of individuals directly from the Department of Motor Vehicles for purposes of enforcing the Automotive Repair Act and the Motor Vehicle Inspection Program. SB 210, Heavy Duty Vehicle Smog Check Program. This bill passed the Senate on May 31st, 2017 and was referred to the Assembly. Uh, most recently, it was amended by the author, author and re-referred to the Assembly Transportation Committee on June 19th, 2018. There is no hearing currently scheduled. 
Um, this bill addresses, uh, well, authorizes the Air Resources Board to develop and implement a heavy duty vehicle inspection and maintenance program um, and require, it creates the truck check emissions fund and requires the DMV to confirm that heavy duty, a heavy duty vehicle is compliant with or exempt from the program prior to initial registration, transfer of ownership, or renewal of registration. It also authorizes DMV to issue a temporary permit to operate a vehicle that is not program compliant or exempt. <clears throat> and it also requires the owner of a heavy duty motor vehicle to maintain a certificate of compliance with the vehicle and requires the driver of the vehicle to present the vehicle a certificate upon examination and or for examination upon demand by a peace officer. Uh, it further prohibits the operation of a heavy duty vehicle on public roads if the, if the vehicle has an illuminated malfunction indicator like displaying a specified engine symbol and would prohibit the operation of a heavy duty vehicle in a manner resulting in the escape of physical smoke except during active regeneration. Maybe we could pause uh, before we move on to the second half of your presentation just to see if there are any comments or questions of the advisory group or anyone else. Yes, Jack, did you raise your? Thanks. Thanks, Brian. I, I, I want to go focus on t uh, AB 2825. Um, that bill, when you look at that bill, debt collection practices, you, you know, most people looking at it are thinking, oh, no, you know, this doesn't apply to us, and what's, why is this bill on the list? So let me just give you a little background, because I want, I'd like the, the BAR to really appreciate this, and maybe even DCA. This bill uh, was gutted and amended uh, several weeks ago, and what it essentially does is capture automotive repair, the automotive industry, as debt collectors. I mean, this is so significant in terms of how you do business. Um, it has, the bill is very complicated, far-reaching, um, and is very significant. And it's something that I think the BR needs to really fully analyze along with DCA. Uh, the way it's going to impact shops, um, and any shops, collision repair, automotive, any, any, any type of facility, repair facility, that generally has a lien on a vehicle for services, which is a constitutional right. But once, once the vehicle is repaired and the, uh, the, uh, the shop wants to contact the, their customer to uh, send a reminder to pick up the vehicle and the customer doesn't respond, they may say, send you know, uh, further reminders. Well, if these reminders are repetitive or uh, somehow the customer feels like they're threatened in some way or harassment, if there are uh, uh, several of these this email messages or text messages, that could be construed as debt collecting and they would fall into this category where that could be either unreasonable, subject to penalties, uh, subject to un un uh, frivolous lawsuits. Very significant. Also in the bill, uh, there are some access uh, language provisions, meaning that that if someone speaks a, 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 a different language, that you have to provide the documentation in that language. So. Again, this may have impact on the automotive repair uh, dealer who you know, provides most of their stuff. They don't provide them in different languages. So it's, it's very significant, and I think it has, I think it's going to not only uh, significant in terms of a policy change, but in significant potentially costs involved to the BAR to, to uh, cause they're the ones that are going to oversee this. Um, so I, I, this is one I wanted to bring to everyone's attention. Because uh, I, I really do think it's sort of one of those bills that uh, when you first look at it, you think, ah, this doesn't apply to us. But once you get into it and you realize the significant impact this is going to have, I think it's going to change the way people, if this passes, in my opinion, it's going to change the way people do business. Because if, they, if, a, if a shop doesn't think they're going to get paid up front, you know, uh, after they repair the car, they will ask for money up front, either a deposit or all the money up front. And I don't think that's good for the consumer. Especially, you're paying, you know, you, you have to pay for your repairs up front. So there are a lot of implications on this and uh, unintended consequences, as I would characterize them. So I just wanted to make sure this was brought to your attention. Um, and, and in my opinion, it's a high level, um, very important uh, bill that you that you folks need to fully analyze. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you for uh, elaborating on that and uh, clearly laying out uh, the industry interests and concerns there. I, I do believe we did see something um, um, relative to an opposed letter or something from one of the associations or maybe a couple of them. I yeah, I, as far as um, we, we are in the process of putting a coalition together and many of the members on this 
on, the, uh, on this board, uh, Nikki's group, uh, Cal ABC, the Independent Automotive Professionals, uh, uh, the CAWA, California Auto Body Association, the Automotive Service Councils of California, all opposed to the bill, um, unless it's amended to exclude automotive repair. But um, yeah, no, it's a, it's it, it's something that um, again, it was a gut and a men, so a lot of folks are starting to focus on this now, and uh, like. Uh, it, it's it's a, it's it's a big bill. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Bud Rice. Um, and again, thank you, Brian. I, my I, I have two two comments. The first one is, is your presentation to just give us information as to what's happening? There isn't any opportunity for Bar to weigh in and see or say what they feel about each of these things. Um, or is it inappropriate for Bar to say what they think about a particular rule or, or law that's being considered? Uh, more along the lines of that, because we don't have an administration approved position on any of the bills. So it's more just an update on the status of the various bills that we're tracking. Yeah, what, what's frustrating for us to some degree, Pat, to be quite honest, is um, Bar, Bar is responsible to call balls and strikes. You know, when 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 in the, at the end, that's what that's what your role is, and and not to have input into what happens in the formulation of how those rules are going to be in play is odd. You know, it's, it's, a little, it's odd and frustrating at the same time. Um, an example was going back in time where there was an exemption for years seven and eight with smog check and conversations I had had with the with Bureau and different uh, contacts through the department. They were going, boy, this is not, this isn't cool, but you can't say anything, you know, but you can't say anything. So then we're, we're forced to try to do battle to try to push forth the idea that this is bad policy or a bad bill, and then the powers that be decide they're going to do it or not do it. But I, and, and I don't know how Barr's role could be enhanced to at least be able to form an opinion as to what you think the impact might be to the industry that you regulate. I, I wish that was a possibility. That's all. Thank you. Appreciate that. Was there another comment I thought you had? I thought you had another well, one. Well, I was doing one. One is, uh, yes, yes. So, so the first one was was his presentation just to give us a list of the things. And my second one was, boy, I wish Bart could step up and participate a little bit more as to what, 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 what they need to do in order to make it so they can call balls and strike more effectively. That's why. I think just to clarify your point, while we don't have, uh, we as an administration do not have approved positions on these uh, bills, um, we do have authority to provide technical assistance and certainly can lay out the various pitfalls with going down a certain path um, and maybe help in that regard without taking a formal position. So that's, that's kind of the extent of our assistance and our ability to publicly comment on the, the nature of the bills and what they're, what they're aimed at doing. Um, you know, we've, We've done that in the past and we'll continue to do that. Um, I think that's helpful um, to at least make sure that the bill is not having un unintended consequences, as Jack said, uh, for this, this AB 2825. We want to make sure that's uh, the case with all of the legislation, that we don't have something that we're all kind of regretting and no one has spoken up. So we do have that ability. Okay, moving on to uh, the pending uh, bar regulatory packages. Um, first up is bar 97 specifications. Uh, the purpose of this uh, package would be to modify bar 97 equipment standards for smog check stations by one, removing dedicated analog phone line equipment, two, requiring LPFET com to communicate directly with bar 97, and three, updating the minimum computer hardware and software standards. Um, most recently, the package was approved by DCA BCSH and filed with the Office of Administrative Law on June 20th, 2018. Um, it is currently pending OAL review. Um, it, the, the review deadline uh, is August 2nd. Um, so the next step would be upon OAL approval to file with the Secretary of State with uh, file with the Secretary of State on August 1 or 2, 2018, effective date. And in uh, November 1st, 2018, regulations implementation date is planned. In regards to that, see the bar engineering ET blast dated June 22nd, 2018. Um, just a little more information on the effective date. Uh, OAL's cutoff, their 30 calendar day cutoff, is 
um, with the inclusion of the July 4th holiday would be August 2nd. We are pushing for an August 1st approval and implementation date. I have requested from the Office of Administrative Law that they complete their review one day early. Whether they do so or not is at their discretion. Electronic documents and consumer authorization uh, purpose is to allow for electronic estimates and authorizations, transmission and storage of repair transa transaction documents, uh, to reorganize estimate work order and invoice provisions to more closely align with the automotive repair transactions and clarify language as necessary. Um, most recently, this uh, package was submitted to DCABCSH for final review on May 30th, 2018. Um, it is pending DCABCH final approval. Um, upon an anticipated approval, uh, the finalized rulemaking package will be submitted to the Office of Administrative Law on August 4th, 2018. That is the one year filing deadline uh, from the notice date. Um, so it has to be filed by that date or we have to have the director issue an extension. Um, Adoption is expected by July, or assuming the August 4th filing date with OAL, uh, adoption is expected by uh, September 17th, 2018, with updated Write It Right guide posted to the BAR website and available to all ARDs. Can I just take a moment to jump in here? I think this goes to the issue that Jack has alluded to, or actually specifically addressed uh, with the regulations and the fact that they do take years. They do. And there are some really valid reasons um, for that. As you can see in this particular case, um, you know, while we're mindful of the review timelines once we've actually filed a regulation, there's a lot of work that goes into the development of regulation. A lot of behind the scenes effort, well actually not behind the scenes, the public workshops um, that we scheduled to involve the various stakeholders and that can take years. It can take years before we actually file. And so some of the years development are things that are, I don't want to say beyond our control, um, because we do have the ability to control whether or not we even hold the workshops. But it's really an important development, a part of the development of a regulation that we get that buy-in the, on the concept. A lot of these ideas come from the advisory group and the various uh, industry representatives and um, you know, these are not developed in a vacuum. They're done publicly in open forums and give the opportunity for everybody to weigh in. And as you can see, we had probably four, I think four workshops on this proposal um, going back to 2014. I can't even believe it. And we are here four years later. But some of the, rev some of that years of development uh, to get a regulation through is, is, uh, Put on ourselves, and I, I think it goes a long way to get all of those concern. It goes a long way to get all of those concerns addressed on the front end to make a really solid package that we can present to the department, our agency, and then ultimately to the Office of Administrative Law to make sure that those regulations get adopted and do not get rejected. So, just uh, thought a, a little um, in interruption here on that concept or that notion. Um, certainly we want to improve upon the internal time frames once regulations are filed to make sure that there's a, um, the, the review timelines and processes are um, streamlined as best as possible, as much as possible. But um, certainly we have other things that go into the development of a regulation that, um, um, that lead to those extended to, uh, implementation times. Anyway, thank you. Uh, in addition uh, to your comments on this package specifically, uh, this regulatory package went through three 15-day public comment periods uh, because we made revisions to the proposed regulations in response to comments that were received from the industry and also from the public. <clears throat> okay, uh, moving on to the ARG, ARD oil change requirements. Uh, the purpose of this, uh, the, the proposed regulations would be to require ARDs to adhere to specified maintenance schedules um, when making a, a recommendation to the customer for an oil change interval. Uh, it would not prohibit a customer from requesting an interval that differs from the manufacturer's published, ma published maintenance schedule. 
uh, would also require ARDs when completing an oil change to include uh, the following statement on the invoice, specifically uh, your vehicle manufacturer publishes oil change intervals and the conditions and factors that influence those intervals in the owner's manual. Um, we, had a pub we held a public hearing at Bar Headquarters, um, and the public comment period ended on April 23rd, 2018. Uh, since that date, we have been reviewing the comments received and are considering various options on next steps for this package. Training provider requirements. Uh, the purpose is to, one, make requirements for certification of smog check training providers consistent with current licensing requirements, two, authorize training for compliance with laws and regulations, and three, make conforming changes to disciplinary guidelines. Uh, this package was submitted to DCA for formal phase review on December 1st, 2017. Uh, uh, DCA, pursuant to, as a part of the DCA legal review, um, Revisions had uh, been recommended. Revisions were made to the initial statement of reason, uh, which uh, we are in the process of, of revising that, that ISOR. Uh, next step would be to, com uh, upon completing the, the revisions to the ISOR, uh, the DCABCH formal review can then uh, move forward, and we will file with OAL to begin the 45 day public comment period. Star program cleanup. Uh, Purpose is to delete outdated Gold Shield program provisions, amend the STAR eligibility criteria, and revise STAR suspension process to be consistent with the statute. Um, most recently, this uh, package was submitted to DCABCSH for formal review on May 22nd, 2018. Uh, it is currently pending that formal review. And the next step would be upon completion of the DCABCSH formal review, uh, it will be filed with OAL to begin the 45-day public comment period. Exempt services. Uh, this package would exempt roadside and other services from de the definition of the repair of motor vehicles. Um, most recently, the rulemaking package was submitted to DCABCSH for formal review on May 8th, 2018. Um, although the, the process is ongoing for the formal review, BAR is monitoring the 2718 legislative session to see if this issue is addressed via legislation. Brake and lamp stations and adjusters. Uh, the purpose of this uh, regulatory package is to revise identification numbers for station and adjuster licensing applications, license renewal and equipment requirements, handbooks providing procedures related to the inspection of brake and lamp systems and issuance of brake and lamp certificates and brake and lamp certificate adjustment compliance. In addition, it would eliminate the gross vehicle weight rating restriction of vehicles to be inspected and certified by Class C stations. Uh, most recently, the rulemaking package was submitted to DCA Legal for informal review on March 30th, 2018. Uh, we have recently, we did receive, I believe, at the, towards the end of May, uh, revisions uh, from DCA Legal on, uh, on this package, various documents within the package. Um, so we are in the process of revising the rulemaking package based on uh, the informal review. Um, upon uh, completing the revisions, uh, we'll resubmit those documents and uh, DCA Legal will co complete its informal review. Um, upon approval, we would then submit to DCA BCH for the formal review phase and upon approval file with OAL to begin the 45-day public comment period. Um, any additional questions or comments uh, outside of this, uh, this meeting, uh, you can submit them to me at the address or telephone number email address that's up on the screen. Any questions or comments for Brian? Uh, Charlie, Charlie Peters. I'm not very smart, and I certainly uh, I'm not very prolific on the subject matter. But I was under the impression that there are two different licenses for brake. One is heavy duty, one's light duty, or whatever. But there's but there is a separate license for 
like heavy, like uh, or 18 wheelers. And I'm under the impression there's only one certificate, and there's only one way that the license, whether or not a person has the appropriate license to inspect that vehicle, is enters it, and it's on the place that I understood him to say that it was being deleted. So there will be no ability to track whether or not somebody has an appropriate license, heavy-duty license to inspect brakes on an 18-wheeler. So I'm curious, is, am I missing something here, or what does that mean? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not sure if we have any one of our subject matter experts relative to this regulatory package uh, in the room today, but we certainly can uh, get the answer back to you. Anyone here from Bar Engineering who's been working on this package? Okay, we'll have to get back to you. I don't have the specifics on that, but it's my understanding from reviewing the package and, and, and working on it that the, the weight rating is being removed, but there are other restrictions that will be put into place that are more responsive to the needs of the industry. So it will not just be removed without any other safeguards to be put in place. Um, there, would, there are, the, the revisions address that. Clay Leak, uh, Deputy Chief for Smog no. Check and Technical Services, Engineering and Technical Services, excuse me. Uh, so I, I appreciate the question, and um, I apologize we don't have anybody that's super familiar with the content of that particular package, but I, I have had the opportunity to review it a couple times. Um, although the weight limit is being reviewed, removed, um, we are looking at other, what we feel are much better ways to make sure that the right people are working on the right brakes. So um, including the types of brakes, whether they're air brakes, mechanical brakes, and then also um, updating the training requirements to make sure that the, the technicians that are working on those brakes have the appropriate um, expertise and knowledge. So um, the, the weight room it is being removed, but I think what, it's being, what, what is replacing it is far more substantive in terms of protecting consumers and making sure the right technicians are working on the right brakes. And we can certainly share the, the, the contents of that package, obviously, and... and um, let you get, give you more visibility to the details. My question is that there are two separate licenses, and there does no designation whether or not a person has the appropriate license that's being tracked that I'm understanding at all. So uh, that just totally confuses me. Why do we have a license? So anybody can just sign this off, doesn't have a license, nobody cares, nobody tracks. I sounds to me like we're losing an ability to to follow up and determine whether or not we're doing a quality job or having appropriate licenses. And uh, that just seems very strange to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to respond to that. My, I believe right now there's actually three different license types and I think we're reducing it to two, if I'm not mistaken. But again, we, we can certainly share the details of the package with you um, offline at a later date. Um, but ultimately, our goal is to protect consumers and make sure the right people have the right licenses. Um, and if this package isn't putting us in that, you know, pushing us that direction, um, absolutely, we should have that conversation. Yeah. Cool. As long as that gets some resolution before it goes forward, I think that's great. Yeah, there'll be a more uh, detailed presentation, maybe even another workshop on this package once it's been finalized. Yeah, one, one, one final follow-up on that. Um, at some point, I mean, once this is approved, we get the approval to, to file the notice period. That is, in effect, that is what the 45-day notice and public comment will be for, is so that the public has a reasonable opportunity to review these regulate, proposed regulations and to make these type of comments. So if there are issues that the, the public or the industry identifies, um, that will be the, the opportunity to present those uh, in a formal manner so that then we can review it and, if necessary, make changes. Thank you, Brian. Oh, is there another comment relative to the presentation? Okay. Please come forward. And stick around, Brian. You might be asked to respond. Hold on. Michael St. Dennis. Uh, Michael St. Dennis from Rivercorp. This is about AB 3097, um, the smog check. 
performance report that BAR does every year. We, I know Greg Colburn is going to talk about this, but we've been doing the review for BAR. And part of that review is to suggest improvements in the report. Um, and in some ways, BAR's hands are tied about what you can look at because the legislation is, the original legislation is older. So it requires older type tests um, to review the smog check program. And since then, the technology has changed. And so in our review of the report to BAR in consultation with engineering, um, there have been recommendations in there to, to say ways that BAR can make the report more useful. Um, and look at the current technology, and I would suggest that that review of the report be sent to the author, and you guys try to get them to incorporate some of those ideas as well in here, which would improve the report. It, the report is very useful, it is, in our opinion, very well done, and really does explain how the smog check program is improving, but in order to keep doing that, you need to be able to evaluate the OBD and newer technologies that are coming. So that's my comment. Thank you, Michael. I uh, appreciate that. Um, we will make sure we pass on that request or that suggestion recommendation to our department and our legislative affairs office um, when the reports are. Uh, Greg will tell us. Have the reports actually been all submitted? So everything's public and okay. Good. We can pass on that uh, suggestion. All right. Any other comments or questions? Anything from the webcast? No. Okay. I'm always wondering if I got the email address correctly when silence there. Uh, before we move on, I just wanted to introduce um, one of the newer members, if not the newest members to the department. Thank you, Brian, first of all. Uh, and uh, one of the newer members uh, to the DCA executive management team, um, Deputy Director of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs, uh, Dennis Cuevas Romero. Nice to see you. Please, yeah. Any comments or anything? Uh, don't want to pass up the opportunity if you wanted to say a few words. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Dennis Cuevas Romero, Deputy Director of Legislation here at DCA. Um, started in March. Um, happy to be on board. Um, as as you know, BAR is uh, a, one of the DCA's very uh, big programs and uh, high-level programs. So, you know, we are um, constantly working with the legislature to um, provide technical assistance on various pieces of legislation. I know there's uh, comments on um, the bar being a little bit uh, more proactive. We are obviously tracking all the bills related to bar and um, always willing to provide technical assistance. As Patrick mentioned, um, you know, we, we have to, we, we are part of the administration, so it's it's challenging in terms of taking public positions, but we, we absolutely hear all the comments and um, constantly are co in contact with legislative offices in terms of um, technical assistance. So if there's ever any questions, particularly on legislation, always feel free to contact our office. So thank you very much, appreciate the time. Thank you, Dennis. You know, and I'm also reminding myself that I failed to do one thing that I always do in the round of introductions is introduce the exec team from BAR. Clay, you already came for, but Clay Leak, uh, Deputy Chief for um, Engineering and Technical Services, which is the smog check program, I think, in short. Uh, description of that. Uh, let's see, who else? Uh, Deputy Chief for Administration, Shelley Whitaker. Is Shelley here? Yes. I know. Yes. Uh, Shelley is recently appointed within the last uh, few months um, to take uh, over the all the administrative uh, programs, um, our personnel, business services, contracts, uh, facilities management, and then also some of our um, that, are, that is under her uh, programs like our consumer assistance program, which is the repair assistance and vehicle retirement. Uh, the manager of those programs reports to Shelley, as does our licensing unit. So all the all the bar licensees um, and licensing operations report to Shelley. Welcome, and then Doug Bellotti, our assistant chief. Thank you. All right, let's move on to our next presenter. 
another presenters, my apologies, uh, this is another standing uh, pre presentation that we've been uh, doing for, uh, I don't know if it's been a year or something close to that, uh, on the status of our California Vehicle Inspection System transition efforts. Uh, it's an actual project, a state-approved project, Cal Vista is its shortened nickname, and Clay Leak, our deputy chief, as well as Eric Schwartz, who uh, represents our database centralized con central database contractor, uh, SGS Testcom. They're both here this morning to give us an update on the status of that effort, that transition effort. Thank you. Like we have a question. You want me to jump in, or? <laughs> uh, yes, Charlie. I didn't see the hand. And thank you. I just wanted to ask for one further clarification. Can somebody give me the quantity of heavy-duty brake licenses? We'll add that to the list. All right, well, thank you for having me, and good morning. My name's Clay Leak, uh, Deputy Chief over at the Bureau. Uh, we'll give you guys a quick update on the Cal Vista project, and then I will hand it over to our program manager, um, SGS program manager. So just a quick reminder in terms of the overall scope of the project, uh, the goals were to negotiate ownership of the system, refresh the system to a state-owned data center, and in parallel with all that, publish an RFP and obtain ongoing maintenance and operation services supporting the, uh, the smog check system. Uh, in terms of status, we did receive final bids, uh, which were due on February 12th. Um, and at this point, the review of those bids is on hold, uh, pending negotiations with SGS Testcom on a revised project baseline. Um, as many of you are aware, SGS reported at our last meeting um, that the delivery of the user acceptance test environment was delayed and that the delivery of the production environment would also be delayed. Um, so at this point, we are circling the wagons and um, kind of figuring out what the next steps are. Uh, in terms of project dependencies, um, we've been tracking the conversion of the BAR 97 units from dial-up to IP. Uh, Brian kind of already provided an update on this package, and I was actually tempted to stand up and start a slow clap um, because we're finally ac almost across the finish line. Um, the package was filed with OAL. We're anticipating an early August adoption, and as Brian mentioned, we have announced that we will um, terminate support for dial-up connectivity on November 1st, so great news there. Um, also great news in terms of um, the equipment. Uh, both Worldwide and Opus have been approved for some time for statewide use with dial-up, uh, with IP equipment, excuse me. Um, as of June 22nd, we all had almost 27 BAR 97 analyzers converted, and I think the number is quite a bit closer to 3,000 at this point in time. Um, additional information is available on our website around equipment certification if anybody's interested, or you can always reach out to me as well. We can provide you the latest information. But we've actually been keeping the website up to date weekly, so... Um, just a quick chart kind of showing the overall progress converting dial-up to IP. Um, as you can see, the, we've made a ton of progress just over the last three or four months. So in terms of how all this impacts our timeline, um, the, 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 the biggest change is that we have obviously announced um, when we are terminating support for dial-up. So that, that's highlighted here. Um, the other three updates um, to the overall timeline are TBDs for transition system to OTEC, RFP award, and contract transition. Um, until we complete our negotiations with SGS and we have a new baseline, we simply do not have dates to report for these activities. Um, I'm hopeful at our next bag meeting that we will be able to have some dates to report around those three milestones. And with that... I will hand it over to Eric Schwarz. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so for Cal Vista, we've had actually a lot of progress since our last board meeting. And uh, last time we were here actually presenting to you. Um, is this one working? Um, 
We've had Active Directory, which is a tool used for authentication of users to the system. That was fully rolled out to all users and was successfully implemented. Uh, and it has actually been working um, to this point with no issues. We've also had several releases of software that involve security updates, uh, additional changes that BARS requested, and updates to the software that have been also released. And here we have a TUAT. And actually, right now, at this moment, we're rolling it out to the production environment. So those are in progress right now. And um, also for the UAT environment, which is the user acceptance testing environment for um, OIS, that is actually being turned over to BAR. We've, SGS has completed their QA testing of it, and there is actually a meeting going on right now as well to turn that environment over to BAR to start their testing. They're going to begin their testing this coming Tuesday on it, which is a major milestone for the project overall. This is the first major significant environment that is ready for BAR testing. And um, they're expected to go through it and check it and make sure, validate it, and ensure that it actually works. So it's going to be, uh, I think, a very big accomplishment to see this done uh, this coming month and next month. The addi other additional big accomplishment that the project has uh, seen is the dis disaster recovery environment. That has been brought up in San Diego. It was all the equipment was delivered down there. It was installed, configured, connected, and uh, at this point is functioning. We're working on some connectivity issues, but overall it's all there and ready to go at this point. So I think that overall was a very big accomplishment. In terms of work that's in progress right now, uh, we have actually up here listed the Sandbox 2, which is one of the environments the manufacturers use for testing their equipment. That environment has also been completed uh, testing and is ha being handed over to BAR for their validation as well. We have converted all our reports from a tool called Hyperion to Crystal Reports, which is just basically a uh, different tool used for generating reports. And that also has been completed and is going to be going to bar soon here for their validation testing. We have set up the monitoring for the UAT environment and it actually has been turned on and this monitoring works to uh, keep a pulse on the system to ensure that it's up, that it's operational, that it's communicating. So this provides uh, early alerts if anything goes wrong so that uh, the teams can begin looking at it and troubleshooting if necessary. So that's all been turned on and they're fine tuning it at this point but it is functioning. For the production environment, we have set up the environment, so that's getting ready to go into testing within the next month here, and um, we'll be able to complete all of our testing, validate that environment, and then turn that over to BAR as well for their validation. And then other work that's in progress here for the next couple months is stabilizing our disaster recovery environment. And by stabilizing, it means checking all the configurations, making sure the applications work, making sure that uh, the network connecti connectivity is there and that there are no issues with that and ensuring that it is talking to the production environment that's located in Rancho Cordova. And then the other major activity that's going on is that we're going through collectively between BAR and SGS looking at the statement of work and ensuring that every requirement that was listed in that statement of work can be tracked to the project schedule, can be tracked as a deliverable um, and it has, either has documentation to it or can be shown that it's been completed. So that ensures that between the both of us, we all have a, a good understanding that when the project comes to the end, that nothing has been left out or that nothing was forgotten in the project overall. For our next steps, which is basically the work coming up here for the next couple uh, months here until our next uh, bag meeting, it's going to be basically finishing off of the testing environments. We have a couple other environments, the integration environment that's also used, the development environment that developers use, and then also um, we have multiple stages of the UAT environment. Again, that's the user acceptance testing environment. And um, that's in sh we're going through those multiple phases to ensure that when we actually cut over for production, we're able to do it successfully and that's going to work. So the, basically the UAT is a trial run for when we do production. This will um, hopefully eliminate any roadblocks that we might encounter in production. It'll cause the production transition to go smoothly and eliminate any potential errors that we might come up with and also reduce the risk uh, to not only BAR but DCA and also customers as well. Ideally, this transition is going to be completely transparent to the customers and they won't know it once the system moves over to the new environment. And as Clay mentioned, we have a couple of milestones that are coming up here that I've listed on here. The first two are on track. The next three there for the UAT testing sandbox two are actually running ahead of schedule at this point. And uh, as we re-baseline with BAR and, and having our conversations with them, we'll be able to adjust these dates inward and have, uh, I think, a good solid timeline for project completion at the next meeting. And then overall, the last slide represents what the original contractual deadlines are. And as we've already talked about, these will be modified and uh, more information will be forthcoming.
questions? Uh, Jack, yes. Yeah, Jack Molodon of California Auto Body Association. Thank you for the presentation. I, I just have some basic questions. So, and I don't know if it goes to Clay or Eric, but so there's the RFP that went out, and that was for maintenance and operational services. And those bids came in in February, correct? And so you've reviewed those and, and reevaluated. And I think the award was technically supposed to be done in June, right? Correct. So now that's on hold. You said, right? So that's on hold because of the delay of this transfer of data to OTEC, right? The data center, right? Is that kind of correct? Okay. Correct. So let me let me just ask, maybe Eric. So when does your contract? When does when does that come up, or when does it expire? Our current contract ends on November 30th of this year. Okay. Is the work expected to be completed by November 30th? At this point, no. It's not. Okay. So then, then what happens if it's not completed? There are several things that could happen. I don't. I can't. I can't tell you what will happen. Um, but that's really what the. Um, that's really the output of the negotiation process. We're behind schedule. Um, the work's not going to be done prior to the contract end, so. I mean, what does that mean? I mean, is everything... I mean, the state... Um, well, I guess the best way I can answer that is that the state was going to uh, move forward in the best interest of the state. So we're working with stakeholders at the department. We're working with stakeholders with the California Department of Technology, who will ultimately um, govern this project and this negotiation. Um, to make sure that um, we put the state in the best possible position. Obviously, the smog check program is something that we have to maintain, and there has to be continuity there. We can't stop the smog check program. So we're exploring every possible option um, to make sure we're able to do that in, in the best way, the most uh, fiscally responsible way possible. So if this thing continues till delay or what, till next year, um, what happens to those bids? Because those bids were, I guess they, they, they came in in February, right? So they don't last forever. I'm sure there's an expiration right on them. How long do they go for? The bids expire 260 days from June 1st. So, so what day is that? they're through about February 14th, if my okay. math is, if February. I remember correctly. Oh, okay. So what happens if we get to February? And it's not completed. So are those bids then thrown out and you have to go open up to, to rebid again? Uh, no, that's certainly a possibility. But the, um, the state has a precedent where they can um, ask vendors to extend bids beyond that initial 260-day period. Um, but all those options are certainly on the table. This, the state could choose to rebid, absolutely. The state could choose to ask vendors to extend the duration of their bids. The state could give vendors opportunities to modify their bids as part of that. Um, a lot of options if we if we have to cross that road. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions, Mr. Rice? Um, yes. First off, if you guys can get past this, you got to get over to DMV, get them figured out. That's a <laughs> mess. <laughs> okay. Um, second thing is from a from a shop's perspective. Um, I'll use the term ping just to have a word to use, but from a shop's perspective, we're worried about a couple of things. One of them is when you jump from lily pad to lily pad, what happens when you get caught in the middle? In other words, when a shop moves from dial up to IP, can, can somebody get caught in the middle? You know, so, that, so shops are worried about that, getting caught in the middle. And I understand that the number of machines that are getting turned over is really getting, getting up there now. So I think that shops are going to get a comfort level from that. Um, but then there's also, I use the word ping again, but a, a, a problem with ping can happen internally here, or it could happen externally where somebody loses IP connectivity and, and, and what happens then? So, so shops are going to be concerned if I can't, if, some, if my internet's down, what's going to happen to me? If my internet's good but I can't communicate with the vid, what happens on that end? Can I continue to work and is there going to be any hiccups for me as I'm going? So shops are concerned about that. So as part of the cut, the cutover from dial-up to IP, um, that, that paradigm really doesn't change. There's still the ability to do offline testing. Um, intermediate term, that may be something we look at. In, in, a, in a perfect world, offline testing 
um, create some problems. Um, but it's, it's really a separate issue um, in terms of the cutover from dial-up to IP. Offline testing is really a different issue. Yeah. Um, and I do understand the concern about lily pad to lily pad. I totally get it. This is a big, huge transition. This is a, from a technology perspective, this is a very large, very complex transition. Um, as Eric mentioned, ultimately the goal for us is to make it totally transparent to smog stations so they have no idea that we're even switching systems. Um, it may involve something like a, changing their password or something like that, but ultimately the goal is to make it as seamless as possible. And that, that will continue to be the goal. I can't promise, I can't promise we'll get 100% of the way there, but I will promise that we will do everything we can to make it as seamless as possible and minimize the impact to business and industry. Remind me again, what's that cutover date? It was uh, November 1st? For dial-up. For, for dial-up dial to IP? Yes. Yeah. Uh, November 1st is the last day. Okay. Yeah. And we've sent out at least one ET blast. Um, I think for those not reasons. using those bar 97 machines, they won't, uh, or parking them, we ought to make sure that those ET blasts are also going to the bar OIS systems as well. Yeah, we're sending to both. We've sent about three now. I know I've had a lot of, few, quite a few stations and technicians reach out to me directly. Um, but we will continue to send out ET blasts. We'll continue to publish articles in the newsletter. We'll continue to write updates here. Um, and obviously Opus and Worldwide are out contacting their customers as well, making sure um, people are in the loop. Um, but I think we've had a pretty long lead time. We should be We've had plenty of time to get people cut over. I think we, we're going on almost a year and a half now, and we've got another six months or so. So hopefully the word's out. Thank you. Just one thing I, I would like you to elaborate on. I don't think it was part of your presentation, but prior presentation is just more of a reminder, and I think it's kind of to help with some of the concern or frustration that was expressed by Jack, but could you at least talk about um, the decision and the guidance we got from the Department of Technology on the two paths, maybe there are other paths, but the two that I know of is either having the current vendor uh, work on the transition to OTEC versus the next vendor and some of the decision making that went into that. I, namely costs on the industry by necessarily and, and having that potentially folded into the bids for the maintenance and operation if that was added to the I was trying to get at that point sorry not to put you on the spot no no that's all right um, so I, I think with any project like this that's delayed one option is to give the existing contractor more time to finish the work other options would be to have award the RFP and have a new contractor come in and finish the work and maybe try to make the old contractor pay for that. There was probably other options as well, but those are certainly two options. Um, I, was actually, I was actually focused on the front end decision on the project itself, whether to have the current vendor or the that's next vendor. That's the a next topic I'd much prefer to discuss. That's great. That was the, that was the question, but uh, <laughs> yes. Um, sure. So the original strategy going way back to the FSR when we wrote it, you know, one option was to have the current vendor um, do the refresh and move the system to OTEC and take ownership of the system. The other option was to have a new vendor come in and do that same work. Um, when we looked at the risk and the timelines, um, this option, you know, having the existing vendor, the vendor that's been care and feeding and maintaining the system for over a decade, doing that work made a lot more sense. The risk to the state was a lot lower. Um, when you look at bringing in somebody that has no knowledge of the system, um, potentially dealing with an incumbent vendor that's very unhappy because now they've lost a contract and there's a new vendor coming in to take over the system and all those other sorts of risks, um, this path made a lot more sense to everybody. So here we are and, and, and we're a little late, but I, I, still think, um, I still think we're on the right path and I still think we're going to be successful. Can I follow up? So is I... Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Jack Moladonov again. I, I'm sorry. It just wasn't the... Fee increased from like a dollar eight to dollar thirty-two to compensate, I guess SGS or whoever it was to compensate to generate the money to to have this transfer of data. Right? Wasn't wasn't yes. that the reason for that? Yep. Okay. Um, so as this thing kind of drags on, it just seems sort of, I don't know. I guess from me, from my standpoint, it's sort of a disincentive to finish quickly. You know, with all due respect, I mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> If you're, you know, you get more money, let's just drag this thing on, right? So what's the incentive 
for SGS to get this thing done quicker? There's certainly um, an incentive for them to drag their feet um, if you look at it from that perspective. Um, that said, I think they have a lot of incentives to perform in the contract. There's financial incentives. Um, so failure to perform is costing them money. Um, that's probably the biggest one, is financial incentives. Um, you know, additionally, um, I think reputation in the industry. I think California is a hotbed for transportation. I think there's a lot of emerging things happening here that I think SGS would love to be a part of. So failure to perform on a contract like this obviously leaves a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths and probably reduces their probability of winning future work. So I think there's a few things, but I do understand, I do understand your point, and it's a risk we've raised from day one. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Anything off the webcast? Okay. Thank you both. Thank you very Thank much. You Clay, you're still have, you're still around go, for the next year in the hot seat. Yeah, he's got your next project, although not a official project of sort, state sponsored project, but something we are working on getting towards that. So the enforcement, it, okay. I was just going to introduce you there, uh, Clay Leak again, with the enforcement licensing modernization effort that we are working on. Project, yeah, a little premature, but yes. So as if CalVista wasn't enough work, we have spun ourselves up another project. <laughs> Uh, the Enforcement and Licensing Modernization Project, or EFFORT, um, is just getting started. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background, kind of about how we got here, because I think it's, it's relevant to a lot of the, the presentation. A lot of you are familiar with the Breeze Project. Uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs started the Breeze Project with the goal of consolidating all DCA regulatory entities into a single licensing and enforcement system. Uh, this was a, a very large effort. Um, releases one and two were completed, and release three, which included BAR, was canceled in January of 2015. There are currently 18 regulatory entities using Breeze, and there are roughly 16 regulatory entities still seeking to modernize their business processes, and that's including BAR. So the 18 boards and bureaus that were moved onto Breeze are on a, a more modern platform. Uh, a platform that supports a lot of web interaction, web capabilities, um, a platform that is much more easily supported in today's te technology landscape. Uh, boards like BAR are still using legacy mainframe technology, which is difficult to support. It's expensive to support. It's not very flexible. Um, it's difficult to make changes as we get legislation that, that, that demands we make changes. It's very difficult to do so from a technology perspective. So. Um, this definitely got the attention of the legislature, and there were several bills floated around. Um, AB 111 was finally um, adopted, which included some um, guidance for the, the 16 boards and bureaus that are still seeking to modernize their business processes. Um, that guidance was taken and rolled into a business modernization plan, which was published by the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, it includes a lot of lessons learned from Breeze, and it includes a lot of information and direction for BAR and other boards and bureaus on the path forward. So what is the path forward? At a really is that the report that was sent to the legislature in December? Uh, no, that's, that's actually a, a separate report. Okay. Yep. Uh, the plan is what kind of provided the guidance. We are, in addition to the department providing us guidance in the form of a plan, we do report, um, I think, annually now to the legislature directly on the progress of these efforts. Okay. So outside of reporting to this committee and Department of Technology and others, we actually do report directly to the legislature now. Cool. Yeah. Um, so one of the lessons learned from Breeze was kind of um, a failure to do some upfront work, um, what we're calling business readiness. Um, documentation of as-is business processes, optimization of as-is business processes, documentation of 2B business processes, organizational change management. Um, so those are all things that um, we have been told to um, spend quite a bit of time up front and make sure that we're ready to go into a formal IT project. Uh, phase two 
is the development of system requirements and very detailed business needs specifications. And phase three brings us into the project approval life cycle and system implementation, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, right now. So this is kind of the draft timeline that's been shared with the legislature and other stakeholders. Um, business readiness activities, you can see right there, go through almost 2020. The project approval life cycle begins late in 2019. I'm not going to go through every single um, activity here. But once those two business readiness and the project approval life cycle, once business readiness activities conclude, we basically begin the project approval life cycle. That starts with a stage one business analysis, starts with a, and then uh, leads to a stage, stage two alternatives analysis, and then leads us into stage three, which is the solicitation process, and stage four, um, which is approval and then implementation. So this is kind of the high level. Oh, go ahead, Pat. I was just going to say some of the same steps you went through, if mm -hmm. not the same steps, for CalVista, right? Very similar. Um, this is a new process. The PAL process is, is similar to what was done for CalVista. CalVista was, went through an FSR process. That process has been revised, and the PAL is kind of what has, what, is what has replaced it. Um, so this timeline is very rough. Obviously, it was put together without really knowing a lot about what we're doing or even what the scope of our project is. So this is very draft. This is very rough, but this is what we're reporting against at this time. So I reserve the right to change these dates without anybody calling me on it. <laughs> Jack. <laughs> uh, so in terms of status, um, we are in business readiness, as I mentioned. We've been performing organizational change management activities with the help of DCA Solid, um, which is a group within DCA that, that helps <laughs> provide these services. Um, we've also started with some business process reengineering, which always starts with as is business process mapping. We've actually brought in a consultant group called RMA very pleased with the work they've done so far. They have a wealth of experience with, um, with business process reengineering and OCM. Um, and actually, we're, we're involved with some of the boards and bureaus through Breeze as well as other state agencies, but um, been very impressed with their work so far. So just a little bit kind of maybe more detailed information than anybody in here is interested, but in terms of how we're approaching our as is, um, the first stage is to define major functional areas, categorize them and then conduct, conduct research and job shadowing. So this is a very top-down approach, right? We want to identify all the different components of the licensing program and then slowly start to refine the detail from each major process step, um, which brings us into the refined process, the refined processes, which is looking at the high-level business process models and then drilling them down into detailed um, business process models. And then finally elaborate, um, getting into the details of, uh, the, basically the nitty-gritty of all of those um, high-level processes and just further refining them. So again, just another kind of high-level look at the left to right, schedule a kickoff meeting. I'll show you a quick example of a functional area breakdown, some of the activities that are occurring within job shadowing, the high-level business process models, the details, and then finally kind of approval. And then um, this gets us into the, once we're through with this, this actually gets us into the 2B and then the functional requirement specifications. So here's an example, probably a little bit too detailed for anybody to read. I apologize for that. I just didn't know how to kind of graphically present something um, any differently than this to kind of paint the picture. Um, so this is our licensing program and all the high-level business processes that occur within our licensing program. Um, each one of these high-level activities will get drilled down into probably dozens, if not hundreds of pages of detailed process flows. Um, in terms of research and job shadowing, this is something I've been really impressed with the, the team we brought on. They've spent a lot of time with our SMEs literally walking through their day-to-day -day processes and getting a real feel for what they do. Because um, ultimately, that's really the only way to, to start documenting some of these processes is to get an understanding of what they are and how they're done. Here's an example of a high-level business process model in a Visio chart. It's a very industry standard way to document some of this. Here's an example of a detailed one. Visually, not much different, but you could have you know, 15 or 20 or 30 or 100 of these details underneath a high level. And that's all I've got for Elm. Um, ultimately, I think, I think this project is a really, it, I see it as a huge opportunity. Um, it's an opportunity for staff at bar. It's an opportunity for the industry. It's an opportunity for us, for, to, for us to really improve the way we do business, improve efficiencies, improve reporting, improve metrics. Um, you know, you only get so many chances to redo a system like this. If you get to do it every once every 10 years, that's, that's, you know, that's pretty quick. So I'm really looking forward to this project. Um, 
I think I think it's a real opportunity to do some really cool things with some new technology. So appreciate everybody's support, and I'm um, really looking forward to to moving this this particular effort forward. Thank you, Clay. As am I. Um, I can't count the number of times where I've asked, uh, let's try this or let's do this this way. And the response sometimes is the system doesn't allow for it. And so I always say, well, only if there was a project called Elm. And there is. Um, you know, it's a long time in the making. I know we've got, a, you know, it looks like five, six years before something like that at the earliest would be implemented. But it's very exciting to me uh, to see us already underway and making uh, huge strides in getting to that goal. Uh, who else? Anybody else have any comments or questions? Yes, Bud Rice. Um, Clay, I'm just kind of curious. Is the approach, let me, let me make up a story, okay? So to, let, let's say today bars on DOS, okay? And that we're trying to we're get before, we're before, we're before DOS, DOS okay? <laughs> And then we're trying to get to Windows 10, which maybe we're going to call Breeze. And then at that level, there's different silos created for each of the different business groups. Is that the approach? Or is it a environment where all 18, 16 or 18 business en entities live within the ecosystem and they can all cross-reference each other and do reporting across the different uh, entities? So yeah, I think you're kind of looking at it from a technology perspective. Um, so ultimately our goal is to not look at it from a technology perspective first. Ultimately the goal is to look at it from a business perspective first and make technology decisions that support better business. Um, but that, that question is interesting and it's something I can't help but ask myself as a technologist, right, looking ahead. Um, so certainly one option is to, if we, if we um, you know, finish our business readiness and we develop our requirements, and we look at Breeze, and Breeze meets 99% of our requirements, uh, maybe that makes sense. Maybe um, jumping onto that Breeze system is the best answer. I don't know that yet. Um, maybe Breeze doesn't satisfy the majority of our requirements. BAR is much larger and much more complex from an enforcement perspective than a lot of the other regulatory entities. Um, so there are um, off-the-shelf tools. There's companies like Excella and Pega that develop licensing and enforcement software, and um, have tens of thousands of installations across numerous states and, and different entities across the world. Maybe one of those solutions better meets our business need. Maybe none of them meet our business needs and we need to go out and build something ourselves. Um, but those are all, those are all um, decisions that we need to root in business and what is best for the business. Yeah. Thank you. That was a good answer, a uh, good explanation of it. Other questions, comments? Um, webcast? Nothing. Still nothing. All right. I think that excuses you right. for the remainder of see the, you guys next quarter. the day. Yeah, see you next quarter. All right. Next up, Jean Lopez. Welcome, Jean. An update, or not an update, a presentation on new vehicle technology and OEM, Original Equipment Manufacturer Position Statements. Uh, this was something, I think, kind of, we put the ball back in your court uh, a little bit when you raised some issues at one of our prior advisory group meetings, and I thought it would be good to kind of um, see if we could get a presentation on some of the things that you were, uh, that were on your mind that you were wanting us to kind of um, um, uh, do, uh, work with the industry and work with the stakeholders on. And so I appreciate you uh, taking the challenge to come before us today and give us, give us a presentation. Uh, your former advisory group member yourself, um, representing ICAR, and now back in the industry with Seidner's Collision Centers. Yes, Welcome. I am. I am. Well, well, thank you, uh, Chief DeRay and, and members of the advisory group and to your staff and members of the audience for allowing me to, allowing me the opportunity to deliver this information. And it, the ball was put back in my court. I was looking, um, and, I, and I hope we can continue um, this dialogue a, a, around an interpretation of the current code of regulations as they relate to 3303 and 3365. So, 
an interpretation of, of, of the California Code of Regulations as they relate to today's advanced vehicle technology. And some of the uh, repairers uh, agree that 3303 and 3365 don't necessarily align with the, 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 with, with the technology, the advanced technology and um, materials, advanced materials that are being used to manufacture today's vehicles. And so this new vehicle technology and, and advancements um, are, are allowing cars to drive themselves. And, and, and we have these advanced uh, driver assistance systems that are being placed in, into these vehicles. And we now need to learn how to repair them. And if we have regulations that are 33 years old or newer, but still in that 30-year, in that 20-year 20 range, and, and they're not designed to support um, what the repairers need to do and learn, then um, we, have to bring, we have to bring those regulations um, up to date. And, and so we also have OEM position statements today that are designed to give the repair information, but yet they're not so designed that they are strict in their language. And, and I'll, I'll share a little bit of, of that with you in, in just a moment. So let's take a look at the, the language of these definitions. And 3303, which is a definitions uh, regulation uh, under Part M, says that, that section or sectioning means the replacement of less than a whole part or component by splicing the part or component at non-factory seams. And 3365 reads that auto body and repair frames under Part A repair procedures including but not limited to the sectioning of component parts, just like in the definition, that the, the, not limited to the sectioning of component parts shall be performed in accordance with OEM service specifications or nationally distributed and periodically updated service specifications that are generally accepted by the auto body repair industry. So both of these are fine and true the way they stand today. But when we start to look at some of these advanced technological um, uh, advancements in, in, in manufacturing vehicles today, we may need to take a closer look at these, at, at, at these regulations. And that's what we're looking for um, is, is to have a better interpretation um, or maybe an amendment to what these definitions are currently saying today. And, and just to be clear, these are Title 16 regulations, California Code of Regulations, these two sections, um, which means they're bar regulations. I'm not sure when they were adopted, um, maybe even predating my uh, think, stay here, at, or term here at the Bureau. But um, yeah, those are, I just want to make clear, those are Bureau of Automotive Repair adopted regulations. Yeah, and, and thank you for that. And I, I think uh, I, I'm, it's either 97, 96 or 97, when they were last amended. Okay. And, and so... Um, About the time it, I came on, yeah. Yeah. And, and so um, if, if anybody... Can you confirm, Jack? I, I, you were probably on the scene back then. Yeah, no. We, this was part of the 95, 96. There was an uh, auto body advisory group that got together with all the stakeholders, including insurers and auto body shops, to develop the, you know, those regulations. Uh, so it was, uh, there was a lot of... A lot of work putting that together to make sure we got it just right back then, but of course the technology has changed. Since Twenty then. years, yeah, right, plus, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, that's that's the right time frame, as I recall. Yeah. So, uh, and, and and I have uh, the next few slides are from information that was published by Honda Motor America, America Honda Motor Company, and and they're talking about um, partial panel replacement at factory seams uh, versus what we learned in the definition of sectioning at non-factory seams. So Honda and other uh, manufacturers have, have, have designed the vehicles today because of these advancements in metallurgy. We, we, we now have these ultra high strength steels or advanced, advanced high strength steels and we look at, if we're knowledgeable enough, we look at what type of metals we are working with. And, and, and there's a definite description of tensile strength in these metals. And, and we, if we're informed and, and if we've looked at um, the information that's been given to us, 
we'll learn that there are some there are some metals we can cut, and there are some metals that we cannot cut, absolutely cannot cut. And so um, we have we we have to know this. And so um, the manufacturers have built these service parts, and we can use them as they're as they're supplied, and, and that's the preferred method by the manufacturer, except when using that part would cause unnecessary or excessive intrusion into the body structure. And it, it, let me show you what I'm, I'm referring to there. In this slide, um, we're looking at a service part, and this just happens to be a, a rear inner panel service part. Um, and the example is that we are going to replace, the only part that's damaged on the vehicle as we've ordered this part is, is that green portion there where it's the rear outer wheelhouse. Now, we get this service part and the OEM would say, yep, this is the part you're gonna use, but there's an exception here. If we, if we use that, what looks like a, a, a purple or brown portion up there, I, I call it orange, and in my screen it's orange, but is there a pointer on here? It, yeah. So this portion right here is the roof, re roof reinforcement beam. Now, if we use this part as it's supplied, we'd have to take off the roof. And, 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 and that's the intrusion, uh, that's the exception for, for an intrusion. We don't want to have to take off the roof. If only, if only this portion, if only this portion is damaged. So manufacturers today have allowed us to take their supplied part and disassemble it so that we only have to use the portion that's damaged on the vehicle. You get, you get that? And, and, so, and so we didn't, we didn't do this. We weren't doing this 20 years ago today. Um, we may not have been doing it six or seven years ago from today. So um, understanding um, what partial panel replacement is as compared to sectioning a vehicle is really important. So um, let's, let's take a look at um, steel part sectioning guidelines. And, 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 and these, sectioning, these sectioning, I'm trying to keep up with two screens here. The, the, these sectioning guidelines um, have us uh, make a replacement of, of, of steel parts at factory seams, again as compared to non-factory seams, at, at, at factory seams and, and matching the replacement part configuration remain the preferred repair methods of the manufacturer, vehicle manufacturers. Again, there's, a, there's, a, there's an exception. However, these methods alone are not always practical nor cost effective. Depending on where the damage is, in understanding what the guidelines are, uh, an informed repairer, knowledgeable, um, with accreditations, will, will be able to make those, those um, uh, decisions, repair decisions, um, and, then, and then follow the guidelines. So revised guidelines um, that are detailed in, the, in this next screen are intended as basic rules, and, and check this out, for properly trained collision repair professionals. That's a key point, um, it, because if you're not properly trained and you don't or haven't gained access to this type of information, you could put someone in jeopardy who's driving that vehicle after, the vehicle after this vehicle has been repaired, and I'll show that to you in just a little bit. So, so here are the sectioning guidelines that are, that are described um, in, in the uh, Honda, uh, American Honda Motor Company um, description of steel parts sectioning. And, and, and what we're looking at here is this, this single layer, the single layer, layer area steel part, that's okay to section. That's okay to cut through at a non-factory seam. That's where that, that, that original definition comes back into play. It's still valid today, and we're still making those types of repairs today. But what we didn't know back 20 years ago, or what we didn't have, rather, 20 years ago, were these reinforcements and stiffeners inside these frame rails. So we can't cut those. And if we don't know how to look for these, and if we don't know what they are, we're going to cut into a section and re-weld it in, a very, in, in an area that would change the impact 
uh, or, or change the, the collision energy and transfer it somewhere else where it possibly wasn't designed to go. That meaning that the collision energy would enter the passenger cabin when it wasn't supposed to enter the, the passenger cabin. And, and why would it do that? Well, we made that rail stronger. And because it was made stronger, it didn't collapse the way it was designed to collapse. Is that understood? Good, good. And, and so, so, so now we're talking about this knowledge or, or lack of knowledge. And ICAR has said for, for a number of years now, I think beginning a, a, about 2009 or 2010, that there's no consistent technical training in the collision repair industry. And they, they know that because of the amount of, uh, of credentialed uh, businesses. Right, right, right now, there's, there's somewhere around 3,600, 3,700 gold class businesses in, in the country. Um, here in California, there are 900. Um, and, 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 and so ICAR tells us that they know this because, because it's information based on the 2015 census. And, and in the 2015 census, and, and maybe someone here at the bar can, can confirm or um, give me better information around the California shops, but the 2015 census that, that ICAR looked at data it says there's 3,913 shops. I think there's a few more than that. Maybe not 500 more, but there could be a few more than that. So the, my point is this, is that there's 900. So, so here in California, gold class shops represent about 23%, if that number's right, rep represent about 23% of, uh, uh, of the businesses repairing vehicles today. But there's still about 70% that may not be consistently training um, on, on how to repair these vehicles. And, and that's the part that we need to begin taking a look at, is what, what are the other 70% doing? And they may be doing a, a, the, the right thing, but I have to believe that because they are not informed and because they're not training, they may not know some of the things that the, uh, that the uh, vehicle manufacturers are, are, are telling us and, and, and showing us how to repair these vehicles. So here's a slide from, and I think this is interesting because um, it, it's a slide that's based on a, a miles per gallon equivalent. And, and, it, and it was developed by the National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration along with the Environmental Protection Agency. But, but what this graph is showing is, is from about 1978 until 2011, the average fuel economy of a vehicle, of a passenger car, was about 26 miles per gallon and a little bit less for a light truck. Right until about 2012, when we started seeing some of these advances in manufacturing and advanced high strength steels and lightweight, um, lightweight materials being put on these vehicles and new construction on these service parts, that the miles per gallon began to improve. And, and, and that's what was supposed to happen, right? In the Obama administration, they took these CAFE standards or, or corporate average fuel economy standards and in order to meet these standards, you had to lighten the vehicle or put in hybrid um, type um, technology um, in order to achieve the, um, the, the increased fuel mileage, right? So, so we, vehicles went from 26 miles a, a gallon in 2011 to better than 30 miles per gallon in the, in the, the next few following years. So, my point of showing you this slide is that in order to achieve these CAFE standards, vehicle manufacturers had to change the way they were building these cars. So let's, um, let's look at what the, the vehicle manufacturers or the OEMs have done in relation to these advanced, uh, these advanced materials and vehicles. And so, um, OEMs have a lot of them, a lot of OEMs. I, I'm just put four up here on the screen, but they have used part position statements. And, 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 and these, these statements are, what was the term used? Um, they, they're couched as to, to, to protect them from some liability, right? So it's, it's kind of soft language. They, they want us to only use their authentic parts, but they don't tell us directly. So they use this type of language. Fiat 
Chrysler Automotive says, it does not approve or recognize structural repair procedures where authentic Mopar parts are not used. What's that telling us? It, it, we just don't approve it. Go ahead and do it, but we don't approve it. And the same thing goes with Ford. Ford says that salvage collision parts are not covered by the Ford Motor Company's new vehicle service part or corrosion warranty. Kia also says it cannot recommend the use of aftermarket uh, auto body parts or, or components obtained from recycled salvaged vehicles. And the same thing with, with Nissan North America. So there's, there's um, some, uh, a couple of domestic, a couple of Asian, and, and there are European vehicle makers that, that also have these types of position statements. So when, we, when, when, when I bring this up, and, and it's, it's a little bit, um, I have to be a little bit careful because we're asking for the cake and wanting to eat it too. And, 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 and that's because there are benefits to using used parts and not necessarily following some of those position statements as they relate to used parts. Because the use of an aftermarket or used or recycled part may save the vehicle from becoming a total loss. And it's very common. Today. Let's say we have something like, I don't know, um, a, a, a 10-year-old car, it's a, a 2008 Buick, real nice car. Um, and, 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 and it has, it still has a certain value. Let's say it's um, $15,000. But repairs to the front end of that vehicle, if they're all OEM or all original equipment parts, could reach the, the threshold value of that vehicle and total it out. Now the owner of that vehicle might be um, a senior, someone more, yeah, I don't know, 75 years old, let's throw a number out there. And they would prefer to not have to start payments all over again on a car. So the opportunity might be for us to use used parts to keep that vehicle from being a total loss. Now, according to some OEMs, there are some parts structural and suspension parts that have to be original equipment. And, and we tend to agree with that. But uh, on the other side, we have some business partners who are insurers, and the insurers dictate via their policies that used or aftermarket parts must be used, even on late model vehicles. So we're in a real pickle here. Um, we want our cake to, and eat it too. We, we need to follow um, policies that around suspension and structural parts. And when we have a brand new vehicle, a 2018 with a thousand miles on it, we want to be able to use that brand new part as well. It, it's, it's, um, it, 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 it's a bit of a challenge. But we do want to make, I do want to make clear here is that um, while there are position statements for parts, we, we don't want to um, include those in position statements for procedures. It, it, there's, a, there's a very definite line there. And so we see that, that position statements used, the position statements for used or aftermarket parts are, are difficult to follow because the current position statements are printed, uh, are a printed representat representation of an OEM's philosophy. The, what they're trying to do is, is have a little brand um, conquering the, the, or aftermarket conquering. The, they only want to sell their parts, and, and rightly so. They, they should. And, and, and so um, uh, in some cases, we, 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 need, we need to um, align with them. And in other cases, we need to be able to go and take a used part off a salvage vehicle it, that's bolted on. Let, let's make that certainly clear, that, that we're using bolted on parts so that there's no structural suspension um, I included in when we use those type of parts. So I, 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 I also, the, some of these position statements on parts are difficult to follow because unless the OEM has statements on used or aftermarket parts that, that include terms like prohibited or not, uh, not authorized, until we have that from the OEMs, um, it just looks like um, the, their statement is just ex expressing their preference. And, and we know that it is. But, and I have to be, be certain about this, that position statements for specific repair procedures, 
and replacement of these parts must be followed. And ICAR, ICAR has also put a bulletin out regarding OEM procedures versus ICAR because in, in, in that um, Regulation 3365, the statement of, of, uh, 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 of, of using, um, the, pardon me for a second. The portion of, of 3365 where it says naturally distributed and periodically updated service specifications that are generally accepted by the auto body repair industry. This is what this is speaking to, right? The, the, the generally accepted portion. And, and, and ICAR um, put this out, I, I think, in 2015. And, and, and it be, because of some of these position statements that were coming out and because of learning that vehicles weren't being prepared properly, they had to make the statement to say, always follow the vehicle maker procedures. And OEM procedures are service specifications, not recommendations, like a, like, like a parts position statement is. Parts position statement tend to be a recommendation. The, these service specifications are must do, must have stuff. And so, ICAR says that first and foremost, always refer to the body repair manual for the make, model, year, and position, and part in question. And then, if that doesn't exist, the next step would be to refer to any original equipment manufacturer specific um, published position statement or a general procedure. So, it, if we're repairing a car and we go to look to see how um, it, was, it was manufactured, and if there's any specifications um, to the rebuilding this car, and we don't find any, we're, we have the opportunity here to go look, and, 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 and we know that, you know, uh, in certain hits, you, you have to perform certain procedures, so we'll know where to go find those. If you don't know, how are you build, rebuilding that vehicle correctly? And, and, and finally, ICAR says that if there's no vehicle-specific repair information, and no OEM published position statement or general procedure, the last step would be to look for ICAR published best practices. And their best practices um, are inter-industry developed and vetted, and vetted guidelines. So we can rely on some of the statements, or on all the statements that, that ICAR is putting out there. So here are the effects of not following OEM procedures and guidelines. Some of you may be familiar with John uh, Eagle Collision in Dallas and, and the lawsuit um, that, that they were brought under and, and cost them $31.5 million for not repairing a vehicle correctly. One of the lawyers was, uh, was captured in, in, in this uh, or quoted in, in, in this trial as saying that from a jury's perspective or from the perspective of the ordinary public, the maker of any auto is the expert on everything about the vehicle, in, including how it should be repaired. And he, here's that vehicle. I, I wish I could blow this up, but, but the, the scene of the action is on the left here. And that's a 2010 Honda Fit. Now, this vehicle um, um, T-boned a light truck who, was, who crossed into their path. It was the light truck's fault. Um, the, the cause of the accident caused this, this, the severity of this accident called this, caused this car to roll over onto its roof, caught on fire, and because the, the roof wasn't repaired correctly, the driver was trapped in this fiery collision and received, from what I understand, uh, and I hadn't known this before, but were fourth degree burns. So that even, even now after he's recovered from his injury, he still has nerve ending pain um, because of these burns. It's, it's tragic. And, and so what we learned in, in, in evidence, the, the lower right hand photograph here, is that this vehicle was repaired using no welding technology. And, and, and Honda shows us, and it's difficult to read, but they have installation procedures for this 2010 Honda Fit. And on this Honda Fit, there are 120 welds that need to be provided 
when you're repairing this vehicle correctly. So let me summarize all of this, and, and, and hopefully we can get um, interpretations um, from the bar and, and, and from industry and, and, and everyone and all of the stakeholders in the industry to take a look at these regulations and, and how they can be amended. So current regulations do not align with late model vehicles. And, and repairs may not be consistently trained. As a matter of fact, in, in, in my um, research, um, I found this document of California Legislative Information. It is um, Article 10.5 Auto Body Repair 9889.5. Um, Chief DeRay, you may be able, oh, it's the business, it's the business and professions code. Um, and, and, and this is interesting. This, this was last dated um, effective January 1st, 1996. I don't know if anything has been um, uh, revised since then, but it, 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 under 9889.50, the legislature finds the following. Thousands of California automobile owners each year require repair to their vehicles as a result of collision or other damage. California automobile owners are suffering direct and indirect harm through unsafe, improper, incompetent, and fraudulent auto body repairs. And there's a lack, there's a lack of training and equipment that auto body repair shops need to meet the demands of highly evolved and sophisticated Automobile manufacturing from the automobile manufacturing um, industry, and there's a few other items. So my point is is that we're still at that 70 percent, and we were probably at, at even a, a, a larger number back in the mid 90s. So looking at these regulations and understanding where the industry is at today, maybe we can make some recommendations from this department so that we can have some improvements there, and, and, and that the generally accepted. Probably the procedure to repair that Honda Fit was probably a generally accepted procedure that 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 came from the street, if anywhere else, right? Oh yeah, I've got this really cool glue. It works just like a weld bond. Go ahead and put it on. Right? You're going to save the labor of preparing for 120 welds. We can't do that. We have to follow the vehicle manager's, manufacturer's instructions. So, so guidelines and procedures must, follow, must be followed. And I really believe that we should continue this conversation in, in workshops or task force development so that all, all the stakeholders in the industry can come together in the state of California and re-review the, 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 these regulations. So thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions. Wow. Thank you, Gene. That was an amazing presentation, really informative. Um, I certainly want to now take the challenge back to us and see what we can do as far as moving this discussion forward. Uh, workshops, I, I am very much committed to doing that, undertaking that maybe as early as our next advisory group meeting, something to piggyback on the on that October meeting. October meeting, a workshop would be very much um, something I would support doing if we can put that together by then. Okay. Great. Uh, questions or comments from the advisory group members? Jack Maladonov. Yeah, Jack Maladonov, California Auto Body Association. Thank you, uh, Gene. A very good presentation. You covered a lot of stuff here. I mean, you got the training part of it. You talked about parts. You talked about procedures. So you covered quite a bit to digest. I just wanted to uh, touch on the 900 uh, gold uh, class ICAR facilities in California, right? Mm -hmm. So just so you know, I think your 30% is incorrect because the latest count based on the number of shops in California, auto uh, collision repair shops in California that was provided to the Department of Insurance so they can do their labor rate survey, survey was around 6,200 and mm. 6,250 or something like that. That's what I remember in that number, maybe closer to 6,300. So based on that, it looks like maybe 15% 
of California shops have ICAR gold training. So we may want to take a look at that, which even it, it just, it, when you hear it's, that, it's... Yeah. <laughs> It seemed low to me, and as as I recall, in in, in uh, my seven years at ICAR, um, I'll beat my chest. <laughs> we, we we had a few more during during my tenure. We had a a, a few more gold class businesses, but that but that that number uh, um, that thirty nine hundred number it certainly seemed low, and that's why I asked if if we get if we could get that to find a little bit. I didn't realize it was six thousand. Yeah, it's about sixty two hundred or so. If I'm if not mistaken, you, maybe Pat, you know, but that was the number that was provided to the Department of Insurance because they had to clean up the list, and that right. includes. Um, the, the list wasn't as clean because it didn't include new car dealerships because they were registered as um, it, it, under the BAR, but they were listed the way the form was under they sell cars and mechanical. They didn't ha list collisions. So they had to clean up the list, but the bottom line is that it's about 6,300 okay. or, or 62 and a half or some, somewhere around there approximately. Oh, um, so, that's, that, that, um, so that means maybe we need to talk about the training aspect here in California. So part of this task force or group or whatever, I think that's that's important as well because my understanding I'm not a tech but you know usually these decisions are made you know I, I equate the collision repair uh, facility you know when they look at a particular vehicle they're more aligned to not not mechanical but more like a doctor right they go through and they talk to the customer hey should we put used parts on do we want to you know or how are we going to do this are these going to be OEM parts how are we going to repair this stuff so they're more like a doctor right talking to their to the customer to determine how they're going to repair the car correctly um, so the training may be one area we want may want to explore a little further in terms of training requirements and that sort of thing uh, the other the other thing you touched on um, was the John Eagle case. And that's a really significant case for the entire, you know, industry, obviously. Uh, a significant a lawsuit in Dallas. It was a new car dealership type situation, as I recall. Um, I, I, I remember, and it's been a little while, but I remember the depositions and um, reading some of the depositions. And, and one of the reasons, in, in that case, that vehicle was supposed to have the welds you mentioned. Yes. That was... But they glued they glued the roof on. Yes. It was you know, and you hear that and you think, why the heck would you do that? You know, kind of. But as I read the deposition, um, and not to take you know, not to you know, throw our, our good friends in the insurance industry under the bus, but part of the reason was um, that's all they were going to pay for. And they weren't just pay for the adhesive. They were going to pay for the welds. And so the shop, during that deposition, he said, well, that's what we did because the insurance company said that's all they were going to pay for. So that's what, the reason they did it. Uh, and that came out during the lawsuit. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, yes. that was the reason. Um, and so there's always this striking the right balance in the industry because, you know, the, the collision repair facilities are working with the insurers, right? And they're, you know, partners with DRPs. And you want to get this done correctly, repair correctly, but then the cost situation comes comes up, right? And, and so it's always a balancing act and, and very challenging for the collision repair industry and the insurers. So it's very, it's, it's complicated. You know, you've got a lot of parties involved here, the consumer, you, obviously the shop, you've got the insurance company paying for the repairs. Um, I like your idea about maybe, you know, doing something further and exploring because it is a complicated area. There are a lot of tentacles out there, to, you know, it's a tangled web. And I like your idea of maybe, you know, if the BR is interested in kind of pursuing this and, and doing some sort of committee or task force that really spend some time and, and seeing how we can really help consumer safety out there, uh, improve the industry in terms of training and, and, and that sort of thing. So I thank you because I know you spent a lot of time on this uh, and providing us with this presentation. So thank you very much. It was a very good presentation. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Other commenters? Yes. Nikki? Yeah, doesn't this lead us back to the age-old debate of who has an ARD and any licensing instead of just paying 100 bucks to be able to open a shop? I mean, anybody can open a shop and have no training year after year after year. Technicians can come into the industry with no training, no nothing, and it leads us all back to that. So the, I appreciate what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you for the comment, Nikki. Nikki Ayers. Uh, Bud Rice. So, uh, hi, Jeannie, and thank you. Yeah, great, great presentation. I, I, I might have been at our last bag meeting. I kind of broached the subject a little different than you're bringing it up today. And it was kind of like I touched the third rail a little bit when I, when I did that. 
Um, I, I'll, I'll be honest and tell you that this is not my area of expertise. I'm more comfortable talking about smog, but I think this is the next big program that needs to get some attention on it, just like we've spent a lot of time talking about smog check. So even though it's not my area of expertise, the um, story I'll tell is that if you were to walk by the beach and the water heads out, you don't have to start thinking about, well, that's odd. You better run, right, because <laughs> there's a tidal wave coming. And I, uh, you may correct me here, but probably if you were to take the universe of cars, probably the bulk of them end up getting crunched somewhere around year three and six, I, I would imagine. Some, something in there is where a bunch of these cars generally speaking, might get crunched. And if, if, if you buy that story, and I'm, I'm making it up, but if you were to buy that story, we're looking at a moving window that as new cars are coming in that are, are more sophisticated, and you started your presentation talking about um, autonomous cars and cars that help uh, navigate, as those cars are moving downstream and this moving window starts moving this way, this problem is a tidal wave that's going to be hitting us if we're not if we're not careful. That's what I think. Okay. Yeah, you're right. And, and um, my former director at at ICAR, he coined the phrase, um, "We're looking at a technical tsunami," and 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 we are. And and he coined that phrase in, in 2012. Uh, 20 yeah 2012, um, looking at all these advancements and the industry not being prepared um, to um, to understand what it takes to repair one of these vehicles. Well, and even to the extent that, you know, when you look at, you know, why do you have your, why do you have your, 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 your wheels aligned? Well, you have your wheels aligned because for some reason your car is not 100% true anymore. Something's happened right. and your car is not 100% true. So with this vehicle, you're going to do a front end alignment and maybe you're going to do caster, camber, tow, but you're going to start making adjustments to get the car true again with that alignment. I think the same as thing is true here. When we're doing these kinds of repairs, the car comes out of the manufacturer 100% true. Now at the point where it gets crunched, you're trying your best to get back. And it may never be 100% true, but we may agree that 85 and above is, that's, that's okay. If we can get to 85 and above, that's going to be okay. But how you, how you maneuver in that channel is where I think the real challenges are going to be because you're going to have to figure out a way to adjust these sensors just like you adjust for a front end alignment so that you can get the car as true as possible even from the readings from these sensors so that they're as accurate as possible to put the guy back on the road again, right? You know, the, right? Yeah, but the, the, the accuracy will need to be much greater than that 85%. Um, true story, it was just a, a, a few weeks ago and this is in a New England state a consumer um, had a crack in his windshield, um, and he went to um, a windshield replacement, um, and, and uh, it was based on insurance company's procedure to use an aftermarket windshield. So he got back in his car, went onto the freeway, and the car started pulling him into traffic. You see, there, there's, there's a camera on that rear window that's a crash avoidance system, and because it wasn't calibrated properly, and it couldn't be calibrated properly because of the aftermarket wind, whatever's in that aftermarket windshield, wouldn't allow cal. It, it wasn't calibrated anyway, but it, 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 it would have been impossible to calibrate it because in this case, whatever the vehicle manufacturer puts in that glass had to be there. So, so we have to get these. I work for a really great company, and, and, and do we make mistakes? Yeah, but, but we're auditing for those types of mistakes, and, and, and we're making sure that when cars leave our facility, they're, they're done right, and, 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 and they have to be, right? The, the last thing we need is for a vehicle to start to veer into traffic and, and injure someone, or, or worse, so. Yeah, but see, even, even, the, even that adjustment you're gonna make at that time also entails, you know, fishtails back into the right to repair. You need this information. You need the ability to be uh -huh. able to make these modifications to get the car as close to true as you can to get it back on the road again. I think it's huge. The problem's huge. Thank you.
Well, thank, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ben. Uh, other comments, questions? David, David Cusa. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Dave Cusa of uh, ASCC Adam Service Council. So, Gene, thanks. Great presentation. And uh, what you say is exactly true. Uh, the repair side, we're seeing this, you know, this tsunami of technology. And, you know, Nikki brings up the certification licensing process that, that has been, you know, kind of that third rail. Um, I think that maybe part of the mission of the task force or the, or the work group would be to help consumers understand exactly what you're saying because you know you could ask go down put down the street and ask anybody driving a car if they think automotive technicians or, or body shop technicians are licensed and they'll say yes mm. right they they think that we are licensed and obviously we know we're not so um, if if there is the the only way I think that we get past specifically for the collision industry issues, you know, I mean, iCar is great, right? Consumers don't know it exists, right? They, you know, they, they go where their body shop or their insurance company tells them to go or where their friend does or where, where, wherever they find on Google, right? So if they understood that 15% that of the, the collision shops in the, in the state are, are the, you know, the top tier shops and 70% of them may or may not be, there might be some consumer outrage or push against the control of the insurance companies of your industry specifically and trying to get hold of my industry. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, other comments or questions? Anything from the webcast? Oh, yes. I was going to ask you, do you how many facilities in uh, Seidner's? 14. 14, okay. All One of them is a satellite facility. All in there. Southern California? All in, yeah, three counties, L.A., uh, yeah. Riverside, and San Bernardino County. Okay. And you have a guest with you, do you not? I do. Mr. Seidner and Mr. Stabler are here. Okay. Uh, Which thank two you are for those? Having. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. I saw your hand come up. I assume you want to come up. Is it Mr. Seidner? So this is no. no, I don't know who's who. Rand so, Randy Stabler. Randy Stabler and Mr. Seidner's. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, perfect. So I could hear myself fine. So, um, in any event, the uh, to to just add on and, and try to bring some clarity, the Bureau of Automotive Repair is a regulatory body, as a a Department of the Consumer Affairs. I don't think I know that some of this can sound self-serving, but the consumer is ultimately the one is at, that is at risk here. And if we're not producing safe repairs, and it's it's more. Uh, it's more delicate than most people realize. Today, re even repairing a plastic bumper on many cars today is an unacceptable option by the manufacturer because it has a lane departure sensor. And if you put any filler material on that bumper, it won't sense the car next to it, and that, car that person could get into an accident because the car doesn't sense it. So I, I could go on and on. There is no new car that you can buy today where you can replace the headlight without having a vehicle scan, an electronic scan, and resetting fault codes. That is not being done by the 70% or more than that of collision repair shops. And to your point, um, th this, is, this is a hockey stick of technology that the regulators have to get around to protect the consumer. And I'm a little bit fearful after I saw the technology display of how long it's going to take to be able to get new systems in place. We won't, there won't be any cars on the, driving on the road if we take if we wait till you know 2028 to be able to come up with regulations that protect the consumer, so that was my encouragement. Thank you, Rand. That thank was you. thank you, Mr. Stabler. Randy yeah. Stabler from Pride, yeah. Pride Automotive. Thank you. Any other further comments? Okay, thank you so much. Oh uh, well, we do. Charlie Peters. <laughs> I'm honored. There's uh, Charlie Peters, Clean Air Performance Professionals. There's one piece of this that I didn't hear anything about today, 
that I think is really important, and that is was touched on by the immediate previous speaker, and is how do you get consistent quality and performance in the marketplace that we don't seem to be able to accomplish at this point and deal with is issues of misinformation that exists where factory procedure says this when in fact that ain't true. So how do you resolve those kinds of issues and get to a point where you're appropriately serving the public and making appropriate repairs and so there's a piece of that that doesn't seem to be being addressed here, and that part that's being addressed is the most, technolo most important technology that's ever existed, and that's the stuff between people's ears and empowering them to become a part of the system and for th what's between their ears and their knowledge and their experience to matter in the process and to create an ability for that to matter in the outcome of an individual repair. And it happens constantly, it's ongoing, and it never seems to really get addressed, and it's critically important that it gets addressed, particularly right now because as it has been shared here, this is a big deal. But if we don't do anything to genuinely incorporate the guy doing the job and empower him to make a difference and have an opinion that matters to best serve the public in a way that is effective appropriately, then we're going to we're going to crash and burn. That's how it is. What the, the concern here is absolutely correct, but I think there's an additional piece that needs to be considered, if you would, Mr. DeRay and committee. Thank you very much, Charlie. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you so much, Gene. Thanks. Thanks. Good to see you again. Uh -huh. Our next presenter. Greg Coburn, and he's brought one of his staff, Frank DiGenova, on the annual smog check performance report. So we do this every July advisory group meeting to give everyone an update on the reports. Uh, it kind of serves as our um, requirement in the law to publish the reports or present those that information. We use this as a forum to do that, as well as making those reports available on our website for public viewing. I think we go back a number of years on these reports. Uh, so welcome, and take it away. Thank you, Chief Dre and committee members for having us to update you guys on some of the new reports. Um, so sitting today, I have uh, Frank DiGenova, as uh, Pat said, uh, to answer any questions as we go through it. As Pat was saying, this is part of Health and Safety Code 44024.5. That was uh, put in place with AB 2289 back in 2010. And basically requires us to analyze the smog check failure rates and looking at how that can show the performance of the smog check program. Um, in addition to that, we have an independent review um, that is also posted on our website, as Pat said, uh, that is, has been done by Revicorp the last two years. As Michael said, Dennis mentioned earlier, um, the U.S. EPA report is another report that we have out there. So we want to kind of present both those. The EPA report is delayed by a month beyond it. So uh, we're finishing up the final details on that with the California Air Resources Board as we speak. Um, in the U.S. EPA report, it's a federal rule that requires us to do that report. It has many, many statistics that go on for probably about 50 pages. Um, you know, describing everything from OBD readiness to, uh, you know, breakdowns of failure rate by the model years and by the types of vehicles and all kinds of good stuff. So we have many years of that posted on BAR's website as well, if anyone's interested, take a look at that. So that will be posted um, by um, August 1st. The Smog Performance Report is posted, as Pat said, on the website right now. So here's some of the basic kind of overview findings from the report. You actually won't find this chart in the report, but we tried to summarize it so it could make sense here. So it's kind of a historic look, looking at the 
I don't even know where to point. Um, it tested within one year after passing the smog check. So this is what happened at roadside. What does that roadside failure rate look like? So this is giving you a historical view. So you've got in the first bar there, you've got that was from calendar year 2003 to 2006. Some of you that have been around for a while heard of this Sierra report. They did this initial report that kind of spawned on this legislation. So this is for model years 76 to 95, tailpipe only. Um, so these are the overall of the vehicles that went through and were tested before and, and passed, um, the, what their failure rate was when they hit roadsides. So that was a 24% basic metric, and that's the overall amount. So then you go to the middle bar here, and that is a, that is a slightly different model year range. We added four more model years in there as we began to modernize the report. But this is, again, looking at tailpipe failures only, and this is calendar year 1617. This is kind of the last year's report, and it was down to about 20%. That 24% was continuing to go up um, over time as the performance began to degrade with the smog check program. And with the implementation of STAR and many of the enforcement metrics, different things we've done over the years, those rates began to come down. Um, you go on to the last bar here, and that is from this year's report, where for the first time we focused on the OBD tests, or OIS, the OBD inspection system tests. And that's showing you model years 2000, 2006. We know these aren't apples to apples comparisons, but we're trying to give you guys a trend. This is kind of the best data that we have to kind of show you what the program's doing and give you a good view of what's going on. So we believe the program's continuing to improve, that performance is getting better from that initial report uh, way back when from the 2003 data. This is a chart from the report. And it's showing you the roadside tailpipe ASM failure rates for model year 76 to 99. Uh, and this is kind of the plot of what those failure rates are. So on the bottom uh, axis here, try not to hit Pat's face. This is the number of days since that smog check event. This blue bar is its initially passed its smog check. So it went into a smog check station and it passed. And then it showed up at the, at the uh, roadside this number of days later. So here's about your two-year mark. Um, the top kind of reddish looking thing here are the ones that initially failed its smog check, assuming that it eventually passed, had repairs, um, and then showed up at the roadsides. This number historically is kind of the, uh, the main thing that we look at. That's showing maybe potentially these vehicles either weren't repaired and somehow got through smog check or were repaired and weren't efficient repairs. Um, so you can kind of see what these rates are. So, you know, you've got to convert it, the percents here. But you can see that you've got, uh, here's your t at time zero. So we're assuming that about this time is, is right after the smog check event. So some of this is extrapolating. We have very little data that initially goes against that. It's kind of turning it out. You see these are kind of fat lines. This is BAR's best estimate at um, kind of how good the data is. So it's kind of our air bars. We believe it's somewhere within those, within those uh, shaded areas there. Um, you can see that they're, they're fairly par uh, parallel lines um, between the pass and the fail. We believe that that is showing um, some of the, the degradation of the vehicles, we believe it's fairly consistent degradation. So again, you, there's something different about these characteristics of these vehicles that initially failed and, and what happened during that smog check event. This is again a very similar graph. So again, we have the days on the bottom, the colors are the same thing, the initial failures or initial passes. Um, but this is for the new OBD data. So. This kind of gives you a little bit of a comparison. What's happening with these OBD vehicles that are model years 2000 to 2006? Um, and again, you can kind of see similar trends going on here, a little bit higher percentage going on. Um, a lot of that is obviously OBD is catching a lot more things than what the tra traditional tailpipe only stuff that we've been reporting. You're looking at EVAP, you're looking at all kinds of different pieces in that. All right, this graph's a little bit different. This is again on the OBD information. Oh, I skipped. Thank you, Frank. This is on the ASM information. My slides were the exact opposite, sorry. All right, um, so this is on the ASM information. 
within two years. So it's the probability of a roadside ASM emissions failure within two years for 1997 model year vehicles based on the station FPR. So basically what this is showing, if you look on this bottom axis, these are the FPR scores from STAR, the follow-up pass rate for those that don't look at this stuff every day. So it's showing here's your high-performing stations. You know, when you get the one is the highest you can get in STAR. So that's your, your really high performer. You're down here at the zero range. These are the, the lower performing stations. All right, so you, what you can see basically is the failure rate at roadsides as you come down, it's showing these high performing stations are, aren't failing at roadsides at as high of a rate as the low performing stations, as we would assume would be the case. Um, but again, the, it's trying to show that um, as we improve performance, as we change some of the star regulations, hopefully these things will begin to improve. Apparently, I didn't put the OIS slide in here. So the, the OIS inspection shows a very similar uh, trend to that. In summary, the smog check program has improved significantly as a result of AB 2289, the STAR program, and enforcement efforts, and various other changes to the smog check program, especially among the higher performing stations. Um, Roadside one-year fail rate is 20% for tailpipe tested fleet and 17 for the OBD inspection system tested fleet. 15 years ago, roadside one-year fail rate was 24% for comparison. Star stations continue to outperform non-star stations. Lowest performing stations continue to perform inadequate inspections. Upcoming regulatory changes will help keep low performing stations out of star and improve overall program performance. Uh, there's my contact information if you have any questions. We hope, I do want to add, we do hope that, you know, when we come to you guys next year that those numbers are lower. Enforcement, uh, as I think they're going to present after this, has made some significant strides. Some of that we cover in the report um, with some of the cert blocking that they've been doing and some of the station things they've been working on. So we're hopeful that next year it uh, is showing an even better number. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, any Questions, comments from the advisor group? Bud Rice. Um, Greg, do me a favor. Go, to, go back a couple slides, maybe to the iOS one. Okay, you stop here for a second. Would, wouldn't you think if you and I could be king for a day, we would test an iOS car. It's in that red zone, right? We test it. Wouldn't it drop down into the blue? One would hope. Yes. I mean, that's the idea, right? That's so we idea. do the test. It goes from the red area down to the blue area and stays in the blue area moving forward, right? That's the goal. If, if you do an effective repair, that's what we would expect. Uh, action. Well, I think what I would add to that is we would look to see the rate of deterioration of the repaired car be the same as the rate of deterioration of a car which did not initially fail right. and have to be repaired. Right. So I think what we would be looking for not in this slide, but in the two previous slides, is to see the two lines be parallel. And uh, the original Sierra report used a slightly different approach, but they also showed two parallel lines. Uh, but the main difference is they had an extremely high day zero fail, fail rate. On, uh, in 2003 to, two, uh, 2003 to 2006 uh, calendar years, uh, they were showing uh, a fail rate that was something like, um, well, 24% for one year and much higher, you know, out uh, beyond that, the period beyond that. And it's that extremely high initial fail rate that uh, was really grabbing the legislature's attention and our attention. And that has come dramatically down. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, other comments, questions? Anything from the webcast? No? Uh, we have a question from Charlie Peters. Yes, hello. I'm uh, Charlie Peters, clean air performance professionals. Are uh, diesels included in these? any of these evaluations at all? No, they're not. So we have uh, the world coming to an end because of Volkswagen and billions and billions of dollars being expended and so on, and we don't care. We don't look at it. We don't evaluate it. We're claiming that all of this stuff should have been caught 
and there is no method of catching it at all. And we ignore it, and we continue on, and we're going down this trail and continuing to Volkswagen taking over all of the cars and transportation system of the globe, it appears to me, and we just continue to ignore this and do nothing to actually get anything to improve its performance that I see to where the car that's broken is getting repaired. Things like when do we look at a situation with a car that uh, previously failed, whether or not it fails again before the entries are into the machine. We've been ignoring for decades and the issue of entering some information about whether or not the car is something that might be under warranty into the smog machine, which we continue to ignore. So I think that uh, some additional conversation here is possible to improve our system and uh, better serve the public and the air quality in California. Thank you for the comment, Charlie. Um, any others? I just wanted to say thank you. Um, you go through a, a Frank in particular, um, and you before him, uh, enduring my uh, rounds of editing uh, to make sure that the reports are very easy to read for those who are um, not in the engineering division. Um, you know, it's Engineer speak and conversion into uh, regular speak is a challenge, uh, and I uh, appreciate your patience uh, with me in trying to help us get there. I think it actually makes it for an easier read and helps it bring it down to a level that all of us can understand, including myself. So thank you. We appreciate your patience with us, Pat. In the Thanks. Process. Yeah. All right. Thank you both. Um, enforcement statistics update. It's a handout only, but I'm ask, um, Bill, there was a comment I think you wanted to make with respect to an earlier presentation, and maybe there's even something with respect to Gene's presentation on the um, number of auto body repair shops and how that, I think that kind of ties to your handout. There's a slide on there. Can you just come forward? glasses on to see your comment. You had text me, texted me during the meeting. This was a number of complaints related to AB 2825. That's what, uh, could you share that with the group? Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody, and I think it's still morning, or is it afternoon? I'm not sure. It's still morning. <laughs> okay, we're good. Um, thanks uh, for inviting me up, Pat, and thank you to the advisory group for um, participating and allow these presentations to take place every quarter. It's, it's valuable, I think, for bar and the industry as well, and of course, consumers. Earlier, um, with the legislation update, uh, we were talking about the AB, which one again? AB, a, a, AB 2825. 2825, with the um, debt collection practices. Um, and a, as was stated then, and certainly remains true, Bar, while Bar doesn't have a position on that legislation, there have been, in, in 16, 17, there were 112 complaints received by Bar that were tracked for uh, lean, and, lean fees, improper lean sales, storage fees, and then towing practices. Um, in 17, 18, that went up a little bit to 132, and although that's only 20 more, that's actually a close to a 20% increase in those type of complaints. So there, there have been, we do receive complaints related to those practices, and some of those complaints are quite concerning. I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but some of the lean practices and the storage practices going on at a very few ARDs are certainly something that caused concern to bar. And then for Auto body. Yeah, the primary business type. I think that's slide number 14 on this uh, handout. Uh, auto body paint, we have 5,200. Now, that's as the primary business type. We also capture on the registration application 
secondary business type. So that might be getting closer to the 6,300 number that you mentioned and some of the numbers that we presented uh, to the Department of Insurance for the purposes of the uh, labor rate survey requirements under the new regulations that uh, were adopted by Department of Insurance uh, a year or more ago. Yeah. So I just wanted to point that out, that that's where some of that information comes from or is derived from, from our registration applications of the industry indicating their primary and secondary business types. This is only the primary business type on this Correct. slide. Correct. Yes, a uh, question from David Cousy. Thank you, Dave Cousy, ACCA. Um, Bill, uh, so the, the 132 you said were the, the lean sale type complaints or collection complaints for there, ARDs? There was some discussion as to what what of our trend categories, uh, again, the area of concern raised by the consumer, um, would apply to this pending legislation? And we looked at, as I said, improper lean sales or lean sale issues, concerns raised by the consumer, um, st improper storage fees, uh, which is a little associated with it and how those are collected, and then um, towing fees, which, uh, you know, as we're all aware, we don't. We have no jurisdiction over towing companies, but we do still receive a number of complaints related to towing charges, and and so those were included in there as well. So I did a so if we just go on the assumption those are all concerning ARDs, all 132 complaints. Um, I did some quick math when when we this uh, came out in the state of California. If you look at and this is you know this is non-scientific, but there are approximately 20 million individual repair events amongst ARDs in the state, 132 complaints. Yeah, and that... Just saying. Yeah. yeah. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was just going through um, quickly on your slides, because this is a good time to do it at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, well, now beginning of the new fiscal year, but we were looking at 17, fiscal year 1718 in comparison over the course of the whole year, now that we have the whole year's worth of data to compare versus the fiscal year 2016-17, it looks like just at general observations for general repair and maintenance, the complaints uh, went up for, for that uh, in this most recent year, uh, went up for auto body, went down for transmission, other, happy to say, stayed the same. I would actually like to see it go down. But uh, smog went down. Uh, used car transactions went up. Vehicle warranty slightly down. And unlicensed activity down. Uh, kind of significantly so, uh, over 120, 30 complaints dropped from the prior year. Yeah, that's probably one of the biggest percentage changes. Yeah, in huge there is, change is there. Unlicensed. I wonder why. Okay. okay. Any comments, questions, further comments or questions on the, the handout? Just want to make sure that Bill is available to answer any questions because uh, it is a full year's worth of reporting now that's uh, rather than just the first quarter or the second quarter. Yeah, I was going to say thank yes, you for the, yeah, thank you for the, the, um, the presentation, um, the handout. Um, in terms of overall complaints for the year, do you have a, do you have a number on that? It was flat. It's... Uh, is that Isn't it just above 15,000? So 15,000, yeah. Uh, very similar to last year. Overall. I think worth in a couple of hundred yeah. of what does, last year was. So. Does that total include the um, un, um, complaints dealing with um, unlicensed and folks? Or is, is yes. That, okay, so that's the total number of complaints the has received, 15,000? Yes. Approximately. Yes. Okay. That's similar to last year. Yeah. I'm just trying yes. to compare. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments, questions, webcast, otherwise? No? All right. We've come to the near the end of the agenda. Um, agenda item number nine is uh, time for public comment on any items that were not on the agenda. 
there uh, any comments? Bud Rice. Um, so, Pat, I, I did have a, a, a question. It, it kind of had to do with AB 3097 when Brian was talking about the smog repair uh, report, excuse me, this, the um, smog check report. And then when, when uh, Greg was up talking about his, I, I, knew, I knew his report was coming, so I wanted to wait until the end to have make a comment sure. on it. But one, one of the things that's interesting is that smog check, it really is two components. It's testing things and it's fixing things, right? And it seems like, for whatever the reason is, we don't think enough about the fixing of the things. And my comment about if we were able to fix these cars that are on the red line, and why wouldn't they drop into the blue line, I think that's a significant concept in terms of why doesn't that happen. And I don't know if the smog check report that, um, that Brian was talking about has any capability to shine any light on what happens to these cars. How are they getting fixed and how are they getting fixed and what's being done with them? Because really, it's about identifying cars that fail and then doing a service or a repair and then what happens to them after the fact. It's that, it, it, that's almost more important than the test. You know, when you think about, let's, let's see if we can't impact what happens to air, it's fixing cars that makes the difference on, fix, on cleaning up the air, not necessarily the test. And so that, that was my comment. So if, in fact, there's value in the smog check report in combination with the information that, um, that Greg had, there, there's an answer in there somewhere. If, if, I think if we, if we look, there's an answer in there. So that's my comment. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that, that something like that would work its way into this legislation. And uh, again, uh, what the prospects of that legislation getting to the governor's desk and even the prospects of it getting signed. Uh, yeah, but, but, sure. but, but you said that there was power in the data that you guys have that sure. could lead to a better report. Sure. And I, that's what I was getting at, is that I, I think uh, it doesn't necessarily require legislation for us to, to look at other data sets that are not being captured or not being analyzed. I mean, we certainly have specific requirements in that uh, health and safety code on the annual report requirements, but we are, um, we've taken some liberties to uh, go beyond that because uh, when they put that requirement in the, in the law, they kind of boxed us in and didn't really give us the ability to look at newer vehicles, the, uh, the fact that uh, we're losing more and more of those older vehicles to really compare to. So we do have, we have kind of used our abilities to look at other data sets to kind of tell a, tell the, a story about how the smoke check program is working. Um, to that point, I do think there is the possibility of incorporating uh, some, some of the repair information that you're interested in into that report. Um, I'll have to strategize with the staff on, and management team on how to do that. Um, one idea that I'm thinking of is um, certainly as part of the roadside surveys that we do, you could certainly build a survey of the consumer and ask, you know, what's, what's happened since the car was last smogged at a station? So we'll have to talk about some things like that. Otherwise, you'd have to call in these vehicles and and I think that's really cumbersome and somewhat problematic um, for us um, and may not get a very good very strong participation um, but you've got a, a good audience there at the roadside when they're having their vehicles inspected to ask those types of questions that might actually uh, give us some additional valuable information for the report. Charlie Peters. Charlie Peters, Clean Air Performance Professionals. Last meeting, I mentioned something about a possibility for this meeting. Obviously, uh, it was, agenda was too busy for to consider it, and that is a very significant debate nationally and locally over the issue of the mandated use of ethanol in our gasoline and that uh, that's a pretty interesting debate with uh, different entities that have different opinions. I'm of the opinion that if we make it voluntary we can significantly impact the price of gasoline. We might generate a whole lot of money to help fix the roads. 
Uh, we also might impact our water supply, our food supply, have a, have a lot of important outcomes of that. And since one of the primary stated goals of the state of California is to address issues of global warming, I still will reiterate that that would be a very interesting subject to put on the agenda and have some experts here to provide some opinions to help us make decisions as to what kinds of things we should support since we, a lot of the people here are interested in cars, particularly interested in repairing them and making them run properly and so on. So there are a lot of questions that a lot of people have on that subject matter and we would very much appreciate some additional information and some as a part incorporated in the part of the, your hearing. Thank you for raising that suggestion again. I don't want anyone to think that we, and you in particular, to think that we, that, that suggestion that you're at a prior meeting fell on deaf ears. Uh, we certainly did reach out to, I think, the Air Resources Board because it kind of gets outside of our area of expertise. Um, they were not able to um, commit to this meeting, so that's why it is not on this meeting's agenda, but we'll continue to press forward with our contacts at the Air Resources Board on uh, on a possible presentation before this group on that uh, on that matter or that subject. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Are we had a schedule? 1218. I always, when putting together or finalizing the, this agenda, I always wonder if we're going to have too much information, not enough information. We're, we're good. We're, we're on time. We're a little ahead of time, so that's great. All right. Thank you so much, all the presenters. Thank you to the Bureau staff who've attended and presented. Thank you to Gene Lopez. I think he has left the building. Elvis has left the building. He is, um, but thank you very much for that presentation. And thank you to all the advisory group members. Uh, who are here today. Bud, thank you. I think we need to find a permanent seat for you up here. You're a very active uh, participant up here um, in, um, in, um, in lieu of um, Johan Gallo, who was unable to attend this meeting. We are going to uh, adjourn, but real quickly, the next at Bar Advisory Group meeting and the final one for calendar year 2018 will be Thursday, October 18th, 2018. I am not going to plan a vacation for that week, so we should be able to commit to that uh, and and uh, hold the hold that hold to that date. Uh, this room, the DCA headquarters one, so the other, the other building. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the summer. We are officially adjourned. Thank you, Matt.